All righty. Hello, hello, hello. Just double checking on places to make sure that you can see us. Hello, everyone. Make sure to give us a wave or whatever of your choice just to show that we are good and live and we are good to go. All right. Let's get started. Let's get into Indeed. it. Indeed. Hello here from uh, incredibly cold Scotland. It's um, chilly. Oh, I've got sound coming through from somewhere. So I'm going to shut up for a second and let uh, you say something while I go find <laughs> okay, out where yeah, the sound's coming from. Uh, it's not very chilly over here in Texas, though. We are getting a lot of rain, uh, tons of rain, which is actually quite nice because we've been desperately needing it. But this is the second to last uh, stream celebrating Spooky Month or October. Uh, a bit of a uh, different day, but people, we there have been people traveling around, things happening. So we've been kind of working our way up to this as uh, <laughs> Andy runs off to go take care of something. But uh, in any event, one of the... Uh, for this poll, we have built up to Mordheim. Embarrassing. The, you're all good. <laughs> Mordheim, the <laughs> dam, which is very, very exciting because Mordheim <laughs> is not just a very, very important place, but also a full on, very important game in and of itself on its own. Oh. A one that is very, very beloved and treasured. And I know I am with many people that are desperately hoping that if the old world proves popular, maybe they'll bring it back as a side game because it was a very unique experience but uh, we're not really here to talk about the actual tabletop game of war time we're here to talk about the story oh, you know, it is a, an important aspect of more time in general because if it hadn't been for that game more time literally wouldn't exist it was a new creation that was built for that game the entire storylines and plots that were put in place were all again built for that game individually so discussing that game i don't think it's off the mark particularly it won't given be the main focus <laughs> but it's well, not the main focus it did have however a massive impact on warhammer as a whole because it was when warhammer shifted from its slightly more cartoony era in the mid 90s to late 90s and then shifted quite deeply into the dark gothic almost bosch-esque style that was presented by more time and then later filtered back into the main battle game but as we say, that's not the focus of today. Today we're going to be discussing Mordheim, the city itself. What is it? Where did it come from? What did it become? And what sort of hellscape was it during the game, Mordheim? And why was it like that? I think we've got quite a lot of fun fake topics that we can discuss today. But as is often the case with these streams that we do, we're going to take you back in time to begin with a quick... Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're going to take you back in time to one of those rare points of synchronicity between the Warhammer world and the real world, back to 1999. Now, in 1999, more time at the beginning of the year didn't really exist. But by the end of the year, in both terms, the Warhammer world and also in the real world, 1999 would be a huge year for more time, both the game and more time blowing up like crazy in the year 1999 imperial calendar uh, over in the empire. So as is the case for some of our previous screen streams, there is a few important points to bring up first. Number one, 1999 for the Warhammer world is important. And it's important in the same way that 2303 is important, in the same way that, uh, let's say, 25, approximately 20 is important. And it's important because it's one of the great incursions of chaos. Now, this one is often sort of loosely massaged and half forgotten about because it's not one that's discussed anywhere really outside of Mordheim, uh, the game, but it is hinted at here or there at other sources. Most importantly, though, we can say the following. It is a time of absolute woe. The world, not just the Empire, but the world is in a state of decay. In the Empire in particular, it is fragmented into multiple different states. It has collapsed, really. The Empire as we know it today, or as it will be formed by Sigmar, has completely, largely gone. It is the start of the Dark Ages, where the Vampire Wars are about to go wild. And it all started about 20 years before the 1999 date of the Mordheim game, when Empress Magritte, uh, who is basically just Margaret Thatcher, 1979, exactly <laughs> the same deal, if you didn't know the reference here, but uh... Empress Magritte of Marienburg... Um, uh, the whole, let's just say, debacle around her causes the empire to fragment entirely. It is a time of war where mutation has arisen, where magic, which is 
formally illegal has spread to the point that it's common to see wizards, often chaos wizards, bad, nasty, dark wizards, wandering around through the various halls of not just the local merchants and the halls of power, but the streets everywhere. Most nobles at this point have some form of wizard. Uh, there is not just magic everywhere, not just corruption everywhere. There's witch burnings everywhere. The smell of burning is in the air in every major city. And more time at this particular point is a complete... The best analogy for it is for you 40k players out there, um, it has gone the way of the Eldar just as it's about to fall. <laughs> That's an episode. So, yeah. for those of you who know your 40k lore, it's not a good time in more time, or it's a really good time in more time, depending upon how you want to see it. Uh, Thomas Prinnan, the chap who wrote most of the, uh, a great deal of the more time material, actually released relatively recently uh, an entirely new war band that was prevalent during the end times as it was presented there. Um, and it was the war band that pulled down and destroyed the ruling lines of Mordheim and indeed Ostermark where they're from um, at that time and it's a fascinating read if you want to go out there and read it it's an unbalanced warband if you are playing the game don't recommend using it too much but it's an awful lot of fun and has a long screed of background about how Mordheim collapsed we can perhaps get onto that at a later date if we want to do so so loosely speaking we have got ourselves a time of woe it is the end times for want of a better name it is a time of an incursion of chaos where magic has risen and gone wild mutation is everywhere Mordheim in many respects is at the center of the very worst that the empire has to offer and it gathers an enormous amount of people there come the 1999 uh, kickoff point. So, now we've established loosely where we are, more mm. time, is in Ostermark. It is a time of woe, and Ever Chosen at this point is out there, for those of you who know about the Ever Chosens. Um, and the very possibility of a child of light, a champion of light, is also happening too. We uh, we set up with, well, we go for the Hammer of Sigmar. What, where would you like to go first? Uh, uh, I think it might be, I think a good thing to start with Mordheim might be the state of the city as far as what the people of Mordheim were actually going through and that it had become such a place of decadence, like yes. kind of what led into that and how, uh, because the Church of Sigmar, of course, was being very not happy <laughs> about I what was going not. on there. Hey, Dimitar. Um, thanks very much. And yes, I will. My new PC has arrived. It's on the other side over there. I've been testing oh, it. Oh, Yay! Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm super excited. Um, we're currently rearranging my entire house around it because this PC, <laughs> the one I'm working on just now, which doesn't work at all, it's much, it's it's a mess, Um, is getting moved into another room. But uh, yes, that will be happening. That thanks is very much excellent for asking. News. Excellent news. Okay, so... There had been a general degradation of the Empire for centuries. It had started with the major split of the Grand Provinces that had been put in place after the reign of Sigmar, um, and then had devolved into what became known as the Time of Three Emperors, where you had yourself the Electoral mm -hmm. Emperors based in, in, let's say, Altdorf, although Nuln and Altdorf would be a better way of putting it, um, and to a degree, some other places too. Um, then you had the Artillian Emperors, that the Talabicland ones, and then you had the Wolf emperors in Minheim to the north and these three central powers all claim to be the true emperor of Sigmar's empire they were all the true inheritors of it although it's worth saying that if you went over to Talapheim you'd find that they had pretty much outlawed Sigmarism but that's a different story so you know <laughs> are they really the true heirs to Sigmar if they have outlawed the cult of Sigmar hmm we'll have our cake and eat it too thank you very much <laughs> that's exactly what they were doing so this had been this uh, time of internal conflict had been going on for centuries, and it had brought about a general degradation that had been slowly but surely going off towards a cliff edge for literally not just years and decades, but centuries. Ostermark, which is where Mordheim is, mm. uh, was one of the bread baskets at this point of the empire. Wide open plains with forests to the north and to the south at borders with Sylvania. And I imagine you can imagine, gather just how bad that could be at certain points. 
Mm. Um, but it's worth also saying that in this point in the history, uh, the Karsteins are not known to be vampires. Um, the yep. rise of the Karsteins and their takeover of Sylvania is ongoing. And by the time we hit the point of more time, it begins to flip and the vampire wars start really really closely right after yeah, that more time we'll, we'll get into it more time will play a pretty critical role in that huge part mess. of that whole mess um so we've got ourselves um a state that's right over towards the edge of the empire is quite isolated but is relatively rich because of the wide farmlands that it has the places that will become the eerie downs far much later and sort of collapse into well, not the nicest place to live, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And do we know who they sided with in the as far as the three emperors? Were they with the uh, Attilans? Or um, were they, they were uh, uh, they weren't just with them. They uh, had largely been conquered by them mm -hmm. um, multiple times. And uh, the general view over in Talibic land was that Ostermark wasn't even really an electoral province anymore. Although it was, depending on the politics of the time. So, Ostermark have been repeatedly conquered, and its borders are not the same as the borders that we know today. Its borders had been pushed back significantly um, by the invading Kislevites approximately 500 years before the, let's say, the, the great event of 1999. Um, so, 500 years earlier, its borders used to span right over into what most people think of as Kislev, and they mm -hmm. considered that their territory it was theirs they've lost most of that and it's gone back to the forests of the empire as we know them today and that the river there that stands between modern day kislev and ostermark became the new border it the history for the last 500 years or so of ostermark is a conquered people but a conquered people that were relatively rich because they had the big bread baskets that were so essential for the big cities of the empire and where they stood and also essential for the three great cities that stood inside ostermark itself one of which was more time another one back after the other one i forget the name off the top of my head um setting up towards the north um and those three cities were fed by this and a great well of horses as well well isn't quite the right line but they had big open plains where they had the veldt over towards the far uh east of the area and those horses are the let they are pretty much the primary source of horses outside Averland that are used for most of the knightly regiments across the empire so they've got themselves some pretty important resources plus obviously the great mines of the world's edge mountains and that richness also brought a certain level of decadence particularly because the ruling elector count if you wish to even call him that the ruling elector count and the rune fang that he carried uh wasn't really ruling in any great sense because he was a puppet of mm. Taliban land in many respects meaning that they had time on their hands a lot of time on their hands a lot of time on their hands and time as we all know particularly if you have power tends to bring decadence anyway and more time became in many respects a center for this on top of that, Mordheim also had uh, the many places that it has. It has got one thing that stands as an exceedingly important, uh, let's say, location. And that's right in the center of the city on an island stands mm -hmm. one of the most important abbeys, I suppose, um, to Sigmar in the Empire. Um, and it's important for multiple reasons. Um, it's important because it's the primary female-led one. Um, yep. There are obviously in the Empire several uh, various corners of the cult that are mostly nuns or their priestesses or whatever. But this is the most important one because not only um, did it have lots of spiritual and historical and mythical resonance in that there's lots of stories tied with this location that go all the way back to the time of Sigmar, um, but it was also the primary one that nobles from across the empire, if they had errant daughters or if they had anyone else that they wished to send them somewhere, it's that particular abbey that they would send them to. The rock. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed, the rock. Um, and... That meant that you not only gathered a great well of Sigmarism right at the heart of the city itself, but that well of Sigmarism was strongly related to families from across the empire, as they had various women who had come from various important families from various corners of the empire gathering there and 
being taught in the ways of this particular brand of Sigmarism, the Holy Sisters that were there. Um, and the Holy Sisters there also had one thing which uh, stands separate to many other parts of the cult, and they were strongly centered around the concept of augurs. Uh, the mm -hmm. concept of being able to see into the future, and the concepts of being able to also to see into the past. Um, and they had entire let's say, wings of that particular part dedicated to seeing future, receiving visions from Sigmar. And this comes hand in hand with what's about to come because yep. their and augurs perceive something about to occur. Yep, and they were the they were the scary kind of augurs too, the ones that usually don't have eyes for whatever reason, uh, which is why they usually have really crazy helmets or bandages wrapped around. Uh, something that uh, a character in Lawhammer is <laughs> dealing yeah, with. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, and who is also an auger, which is uh, quite fun in, in my game. Um, so uh, where do we even start? There are so many different ways that we could tackle the next step. Yeah, so uh, I I think uh, I would like to take a moment to get a, just slip in a fun little conspiracy moment, a little, a little right, theory a thing. Well. Uh, just done. slip those in where possible because more time is very dense. Um, mm. So Mordheim uh, is, um, as kind of Andy talked about, is this, and it's it's a big city. Like there are a ton of people have been showing up because of the wealth. It's bringing in more and more people, a lot of merchants, a lot of nobles, uh, because almost anything can be found there. And they were actually very well positioned because Sylvania, uh, as we talked about, wasn't great these days uh the sylvania did deal with a pretty nasty set of circumstances a few centuries back during the black plague where it was a particularly devastating in sylvania and b there was a big rain of um uh warpstone meteors that had happened uh, not too long before that which is why a lot of the problems sylvania has were there and also all those meteors brought the skaven in large numbers to sylvania which was just awful and then of course that's where uh, everybody's favorite necromancer van hal cropped up who actually is much more of a fascinating figure we don't have time to really get into him but he is he's a lot more dynamic than just a big bad necromancer because without him the empire probably would have fell to the skaven to be honest um but in any event sylvania had already had a lot of problems and so more time was kind of that perfect distance away to reap all the benefits of really being the only major force in that little part of the empire um, there was really nobody else to contest them. And so they're reaping all the rewards and benefits of that. And the city is very well positioned defensively um, in that it was a, it had wonderful walls, massive garrisons, uh, powerful legions. And it started to, of course, with that decadence, draw in all sorts of nefarious forces as well. There were a lot of agents of various powers that were involved in the city, not just chaos, but also the von Karsteins who were rising uh, and nobody knew they were vampires, but Vlad was spreading his gifts uh, very extensively around Sylvania. In fact, by this point, I think most of the major houses had already been turned, uh, though most people probably were not aware of it. And the people of Sylvania were, for lack of a better term, good at keeping their heads down and not asking too many questions <laughs> because you don't ask questions in Sylvania or you're going to end up uh, dead somewhere very quick. And then there were also forces from beyond the Empire as well. Um, not only do you have like the Skaven uh, around because it is close to areas of interest for them, but where there's people, there's Skaven. Because oftentimes, um, I, I I don't know if I would say that under Mordheim was a particularly large Skaven warren, but there was definitely a Skaven presence. Uh, because where there's power, there are things the Skaven can use to manipulate and further their own ends. And the Skaven in many ways were still nursing their injuries from their pretty bad failed uh invasion during the black plague which of course went very well until it didn't because the skaven fell to infighting which they always do but um so there is something about to happen to mordheim which is that so, let's oh yeah let's go ahead jump into that bit, because the bit excites me that the bit where it goes now this ties directly into some of our previous streams as well um mm. and whether we're dealing with uh Tehenuin, whether we're dealing with the coming of the end times with valton with all of these great events because a great event is about to occur and it was one that was prophesized and this is the important thing to remember here because it's going to make an enormous difference to the city we are in a time of horrendous woe. There's witch burnings, there's mutants, there's monsters in the forest devouring people. It's a horrible time. 
and despair is prevalent. We have nobles that have risen up, and because they are indolent, they have got more around them, uh, great wealth about them, and peasants who are dying. It's a horrible time. But there is a prophecy, and this particular prophecy says that at some point, the city of, I think, Sigmar's sisters, or some similar thing, mm. um, uh, will see a great comet above it, and great wings of fire will blaze through the sky, and Sigmar will return. And he will come to us in this great city upon a great throne. And he will come and it'll all be great. And all and all the northern <laughs> land will fall. And you know the normal prophecy stuff. Now, this particular prophecy, which comes from one of the various cantuses of, what's his name, Macadamnus, I think it is? Uh, 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 Necrodamus. Ne no, Necrodomus. it's not it's not Necrodomus. Oh, they're the two different insane. ones. It's a different one. This is Macadamnus. Now, Macadamnus, um, as you will come to find out later, wasn't necessarily getting this prophecy from Sigmar. He was getting this prophecy from someone who was posing effectively as Sigmar. And there's all manner of stuff we can dive into here as to exactly what that was. But for those of you great lovers of lore, um, this was what would become the great replacement of Malal, the fifth chaos power, where these particular uh, prophecies were coming from. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, that is the good old Dark Father himself. Now, these particular canticles had set up something that was enormous and a, a great event that would occur and would bring about Sigmar back on Earth. It would be the saviour during another end times. And it became quite clear as the sisters of Sigmar, sitting in their rock, the good old holy order, the sisters of Sigmar, um, start receiving yet more great visions that, yes, the end times were coming, and yes, it was all terrible, but a comet was going to come, and it was going to come to more time. Mm -hmm. Sigmar's coming! Yay! <laughs> and they weren't wrong, because up in the sky in 1999, a comet with twin tails of fire behind it, the great wings of fire that were prophesied, screeches across the heavens. And for weeks, it gets bigger and gets bigger. And it gets, wait a minute, for those of you who watch the Moss stream, you might be hearing some similar <laughs> things here, but that's because yeah. it's the same story again. It gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger to the point that it eventually drowns out all the light of even the sun. Let's just pop up the one from there, Hammy. Uh, there's no Hammond <laughs> posing as Sigmar. Valton saying nothing. Um, very <laughs> poor, poor Valton. <laughs> poor Valton. Everybody, everybody likes Duncan on Vulcan. <laughs> I, he deserves it. Uh, yeah, he does. <laughs> I like Valton, though. Um, so it's getting bright. Now, what does that mean to the people down on the ground? It means literally everything. Because this is a time of terror, of woe, and suddenly salvation is in the sky. So everybody starts to gather in Mordheim. Yeah. Everybody. It, yeah, they, they travel do. from all over the Empire to arrive at Mordheim. Yeah, this wasn't a, a, you know, this wasn't a people say, oh, God, it's an impending doom. It was, oh, the, it's the coming of God. Like, there's, there's words getting out. There's a prophecy. Mm -hmm. Sigmar mm -hmm. himself is coming down mm -hmm. to save us. There are rumors of some big bad chaos champion who we will talk about is coming and is coming here. He's coming to fight Sigmar. We got to go. We're, we're going to see this. We got to be blessed. And of course, I mean, this is empire wide. And yeah, there's even people from other nations showing up to witness this because there's this big comet and a prophecy and that's going to be taken seriously. And anyone, people who have those kinds of senses can sense something important is about to go down. So you have forces but from other nations Sigmar. appearing. Yeah, it no. <laughs> it wasn't no. Sigmar. It wasn't Sigmar coming. Just, just spoiler alert. It really, really wasn't Sigmar. And much like the comet that slams uh, into the borderlands over with Cathay and forms the Maw, the one that slams into more time when not just a few scores or a few thousand, but hundreds of 
thousands of people from across the empire. We're talking millions had now gathered in Mordheim. This is not a small number of people. And for those of you out there who love to debate, how big are the cities um, in Warhammer? Are they a few tens of thousands? Are they hundreds of thousands? The population of Mordheim at this point, we know is in the millions. It's mentioned in the text in a couple of places, the words hundreds of thousands had gathered, not just a 10, hundreds or 12. Literally everyone that could get their HUD. There was camps all around the city. This place was absolutely chock-a-block full of crazed folks. But they were not all sitting there going praise be to Sigmar because corruption had completely taken the land by this point. Now, we mentioned already earlier in the stream that this is the uh, the upcoming build-up towards an end times to the point that at various points during the releases of more time, they often say things like, you know, if you want to end the world now, do it. If you want to do it for your campaign, that makes sense because this is quite literally an end of the world moment. And in terms of the overall Warhammer world story, this is a point where the, the Chaos Gods gave it a good go. Mm. They yeah, fail. But they definitely gave it a good go. And and the other thing to really consider with those hundreds of thousands of people, like Andy said, is there were very different kinds of people having gathered. Some people were pious and had come to witness, but a lot of people were partying. And uh, not, not partying in like a casual sense. Like they were getting into some horrible, decadent, weird shit. Mutants were everywhere. Witches were everywhere. Cultists were everywhere. And they all came out to worship this great incoming comet. This is a classic Sodom and Gomorrah moment if you are wishing to look at one. This is where the people are about to be punished for their sins. And by the gods are they. But there is one group that manages to survive this. And that's the Sisters of Sigmar sitting in their little rock in the very centre of the city. And the reason that they survive this is because they have got their own prophets. And Cassandora, one of the great seers, goes... I'm not sure this is what it should be. Ah, and they pray and they pray and they pray and they do a host of old Sigmarite rituals that effectively protect them for what's about to occur. As the comet doesn't just fly over and drop a handy little Sigmar by parachute into the middle of all those people going, I'm back! Yes! It is time to be Sigmar! And I'm going to go reclaim the Empire and without whatever hordes are coming from the north, we're going to sort them out. Not a problem. No, the comet just doesn't stop. The comet comes down and it slams directly into and should destroy not just the city, but everything else too. But Sigmarites doing their job, to a degree, lessen the worst of what would happen when this comet hits. But let us not think that this was a minor event. In one description, it's described as a pillar of fire that goes for miles into the heavens as it strikes and whoosh! An enormous Hiroshima level, probably bigger event occurs. And everything in the surrounding vicinity is to a degree wiped out. The temple sitting on the rock stands and does not fall. Buildings are flattened near the very center of the impact. All the way around the city, some fall, some stay up. Ruins are left in their place. And those hundreds of thousands that have gathered are almost to a man eradicated. Mm. The big question is, who struck and what struck? According to some fables, they say it was Sigmar taking revenge upon the people for the great horrors that had occurred in his name in this great decadent city of Mordheim. However, the truth behind it, as we would later find out, was much darker, much more awful, and spanned back to all the prophecies that had been spoken about about the end times. Those prophecies had come from a source. Yeah, hey, Hammond. And the words were voice. Belakar barged in and said, What's that noise? Man, you're just jealous. It's the beastman boys. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. Um <laughs> Thank the hammer you, of stigma was almost anything but, and I think speaks to um, many of our previous streams regarding the various twin tail comets that come <laughs> are normally made of warp stone, spat mm. out. And indeed, this one is confirmed to have been spat out from Morsleib. Go check our Morsleib stream for more on Morsleib. It spits out, it comes in, it orbits round, and it comes slamming down and into the very worst of cities in the Empire, almost like it was summoned there. Um, and boom, but it was also carrying someone. 
Yeah. So uh, there are. So the fun thing about more time, the really fun thing about more time from a lore perspective is that in universe, it is one of the fairly few scenarios that pretty much everybody knows about. And because of that, there are a lot of really fun theories within universe of different groups and factions trying to explain why this happened because everyone was smart enough to realize that something designed this to happen meteors as far as the, the people in warhammer world are smart enough to know that big meteors of warpstone don't tend to just fall out of nowhere on a very heavily populated city and eradicate everyone it came off as very purposeful and like andy said there are some forces especially the cult of sigmar who said, oh, it was divine punishment. You got what you deserved. That's what you get when you don't do what we tell you to do, is, of, of course, how they framed it. Uh, if, you know, if you're out there and doing sin, if you're not following the words of Sigmar, he's going to chuck a meteor at you guys because that's what you deserve. Um, and what's interesting is there's been some, there's some interesting caveats uh, within it of there were also forces within the, the church that really did not like the Sisters of Sigmar in particular because uh, they viewed them as a threat um to their authority and their power oh thanks for the cheers uh, i'm not casting aspirations but Cathay does have a record of so many big hunts of war show where were they when they went down well that see that what i'm about to say is within like newer lore with Cathay being a more thing a more present thing i would not be shocked if there are wizards out there who learn about what happened with the great maw and go i wonder if the dragon emperor did that because we were getting too powerful here in the west we were rising up we were getting too mighty he saw us as a rival empire and what if he threw a meteor at us i would i would if i ever got to write like kind of a crackpot astromancer of the celestial colleges <laughs> i would absolutely have a a weirdo within the celestial college who like rambles about that theory to anyone he can get to listen to him and everybody else just hates if they're stuck alone in a room with him because he goes off about how the Cathayans are throwing meteors at everybody. But um, what happens with more time and the, the main kind of uh, thrust behind it is one particular baddie, a very important baddie that a lot of people very much like who takes on a fun little bonus name. Um, the dog. Yeah, while he's in town, which is the Dark Master. Dark uh, Master. <laughs> uh, the Dark Master of Mordheim, uh, who those who get close enough to him know as the Shadow Lord, which probably yeah. should be enough of a hint for you to figure out who it is, Shadow. is that the grand architect behind a lot of what goes down is revealed to be Bellicor. Arguably the grand architect of everything that goes down is Bellacor. Um, and when this uh, comet strikes, it's seven days and seven nights, which I always thought was not the most Warhammery lineup. It could have been eight days and eight nights, but whatever. Mm. Seven days and seven nights of pure hell. The burning of this meteorite that has struck uh, makes it far too hot for anyone to get within the old walls of the city. Um, a pall of smoke and shadow covers everything and never really properly recedes, where beforehand there was no night and day because that comet it was so bright that the night was as light as day suddenly all became darkness and not only did all become darkness over the course of this next week of hell as we move into the new year because it almost certainly struck down right on the hexenstag as we move into the new year and the awfulness becomes apparent trees in some places grow within a day and other places they come out twisted and broken leaves fall off of everything on evergreens people start mutating those who were out in the periphery and survived it out in their camps mutations start spreading like wildfire people are becoming something new anything that survives inside the city itself become something terrible, something broken. The Elector Count, who had been cavorting like mad in there, Steinhardt and the Elector Count of Oster, Oster, bleh, Ostermark, um, he had died <laughs> along with his entire court, but some of the court survived in the most horrendous state. Indeed, quiet corners of the city, whether it was down in cellars, whether it was down elsewhere, have survived, and they do not survive in a kind way. They are properly broken by the horror of what this comet 
rep, uh, represents, not just because the comet itself has burned them, but because of what it's made of. And I think there is something important here to say because Mordheim takes a step away from standard Warhammer lore here and presents a different version of what we all know as Warp Stone. Um, and in Mordheim, they present it as Weird Stone. And Weird Stone is just Warp Stone. It's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. But the Weird Stone here has a host of properties that is not normally associated with Warp Stone. Not only does it have a host of properties, people are picking this shit up. Just like it's any old other rock that might be lying around and not turning into crazed, mutated dogs just for having a quick handle of it. The Warp Stone that's around here is different. And there's a reason it's different. It's because it has been changed to a degree by what's riding within it the dark master that we've already referenced bellicor who is who is pretty much the replacement for malal for those of you who know your old lore he is quite literally the god of undivided chaos who never quite made it to the same height as the other four chaos powers he is however even in the weakened state that we have him built up for here in more time exceedingly and extraordinarily powerful, but somewhat stymied by curses that have been placed upon him by the other ruinous powers. So we've got this great spread of warp stone that's gone everywhere, but it's not like normal warp stone. People can pick it up and things start happening. Some people, as they pick it up, are healed. Others, as they place it against something, the thing they place it against, it turns to gold. Mm. Others who are um, naturally wizards or witches or have some ability with magic, realize that they can just hold it and channel the most powerful, extraordinary of magics. Others realize that it can be used to fuel great holy rituals, not just unholy, but holy rituals. Others realize it can be used for unholy rituals. Pretty much every faction that is out there in the Warhammer world sees something that they can use in this. And more time, very quickly very, very quickly, no matter how dangerous it is, and it's insanely dangerous post this great impact, becomes a center of great interest because it is proliferated with this magical substance that is enormously useful and thus, in time, enormously expensive. And every single faction of pretty much the old world will be sending people there to try and grab this shit. But it's a little bit like throwing coins into a well five miles deep. It's just going to keep on top. The people go in and most do not come out. Yeah, one of the things that's really interesting um, about the Weird Stone is that it could almost be argued to a point that Bellicor did it on purpose. Hmm. In that oh, yeah. it very deliberately draws in massive amounts of people whether you want to look at that as massive amounts of souls massive amount as potential supplicants or just suckers um and <laughs> the thing that's important to understand about bellicor in general during this is that all of this all of this horrible suffering all of this death this mutation madness awfulness which we'll get into is mm. it's really just an elaborate escape attempt by bellicor um in that this is kind of his first really big um in in the more in the, the kind of the later stages when they uh inter reinterpreted more time to be around all of this this is Melikor's first big play where he manages to get enough of his sanity together enough of his power together that he tries to escape being a completely insane entity that is bound in shadow that can't affect anything and is just forced to suffer and languish in a realm kind of next to reality. Yeah. And he um, goes all out mm, trying to mm. get out, which goes now, to show that how terrifyingly powerful he is, even at just this itty bitty fraction of his power. To give you an idea of how powerful he is, because this is something that is often asked, is it, wh who is Bellicor? Where does he sit? Um, in terms of the lore, we'll probably do a video about him at one point. We don't oh, want yeah, to I'm get sure. all the depth of it. Let's call it, it's not even a him, it's an it, it's Bellicor. Yeah. Um, the, this is one of the rare demons that transcends settings. It's also in 40k. And in 40k, pretty much stands above the demon primarchs themselves he's above everything except for the four great powers of chaos most of the other greater demons are weak in comparison to bellicor bellicor is insanely powerful and gathered that power in the warhammer world during the very first incursion of chaos to the point that the other chaos gods started to get a bitty worried now that might be a 
a bit of a, a projection here, but it's fair to say that he ended up being very cursed for what he became. Um, he was an, he had his own greater demons. Yep. And that that's that just to make it nice and clear, he had his own greater demons. He has a massive demon horde that is trapped, waiting to go. He is exceedingly powerful. He's effectively that close to being more powerful or as powerful as one of the four great powers of chaos. And the only thing that has stopped that has been a variety of attempts, mostly by Zinch, to keep that fucker in place, to excuse my language. Um, so, yeah, this whole mm. thing was orchestrated from him, and at its heart, it was the break of reality that was Morslieb, and that it's effectively almost the realms of chaos up there anyway, because reality itself breaks down with so much warp stone. That is how he broke free from the prison that he was in, and he comes down in this comet, he slams into more time, but he has already sown the seeds for doing this centuries before. And we have a reason for this. We're not going to go into the great depth of what happens to Mordheim because effectively time itself fractures and Belakor is no longer an entity in the material realm that is given a fixed timeline of events because he can literally go through time because of what happens during the events of Mordheim afterwards. Um, and he ends up he ends up being Archeon's dad. There's all manner of crazy <laughs> yeah. shit that Bellacor ends up doing. He ends the world. Bellacor is the reason of, for the end times. So if you hate the end times, blame Bellacor. Yeah. Uh, he. This is where he I actually sets a crazy amount of things into motion. Is he? I, yes. I would, yes. I would yes. say Bellacor is above Hatchet. He's above the Great Horned Rat. Um, like... Yeah, yes. I mean, he's yeah. got his own entire army of demons that are his own. Um, the the problem with Belakor isn't what his powerful level, his power level, is. It's what is it when he's free, and he's never free. Meaning that he's mm. way below all of them in terms of his actual expressed power, the things that he can actually do, whether he's his shadowy self or whether it's post crowning Archeon and he's much more material. Um, we won't go too much into Belakor though, because this could easily be a stream by itself, but loosely, and when he's at his full power, he's pretty much not just sitting beside the four great powers, he's challenging them, which is why they curtailed him so much. Yes. Uh, so the Shadow Lord appears over in more time and he is very much using this weird stone which is geniusly designed so that it will lure in everybody there it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter what you do what your power may be um whether you're in it for money you're in it to help people you're in it for yourself you're in it for power you're in it for good or bad reasons weird stone you need it it will it will change everything for you, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what your goal is, which is so horribly sinister. Because it's not just that it lures in greedy people; it lures in the desperate, it lures in the kind, it lures in the arrogant, mm -hmm. and so all of these factions want it and are sending people. And that's what Bellacor needs. He needs people because Bellacor he pulled off something really clever, which is that he basically kind of just turns Mordheim into a piece of the realms of chaos. Uh, enough that he can keep himself there. He can anchor himself and he's not being blown around uh, to an extent, though he runs into some really hilarious problems, actually, in a second. It's worth saying that, um, as it turns out, he's stuck there. Yes. So, <laughs> Bellacor, okay, there is a there is a very important caveat to include about Bellacor and <laughs> that he is a terrifying character, but he's also kind of hilariously an idiot. Uh, well, it's still, in this case, I'm, I'm going to fight his corner because that's a general opinion of poor Bellacor. He's literally cursed by Zinch at this point to not yes. be able to leave. I mean, as curses go, it's not so much he's an idiot. Um, It's more that Zinch itself that, is, he, in, he, is he very much convinced that it does not want um Bellacor, who has the power of all four greater powers within him mm. because all four of them imbued him as a, a force of undivided chaos. He's the very first ever chosen in some respects, but he's the demonic equivalent before they went with the ever chosen plan, um, which was in many respects to replace Bellacor. Um, so yeah, he's not so much an idiot. He's insane, yeah. beyond, out of his head and sadly cursed. I think. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Despite his corner a little. Yeah, for, <laughs> well, it's, it's good to say he comes off like an idiot, but it's not his fault. It's not that yeah. he has bad planning or his ideas shouldn't work work it's that he literally has a fate god who is one of the most powerful beings in the setting constantly screwing with his stuff to turn yeah. to, like it's kind of like the idea of the monkey's pot right of except for it's that when bellicor pulls off a plan zinch adds uh, an asterisk or a caveat that makes it not work the way bellicor wants it to work totally. so 
uh, what happens, and the, the real important thing is that an ever chosen actually shows up in this story. An ever chosen who very rarely gets talked about. Um, and it's because I think there tends to be some confusion about him being a potential ever chosen as opposed to a full one, but he is functionally a full one. He is the full one, card on the glory. Yeah, who I believe is the eleventh. Yeah, um, unless unless they go and put another ever chosen for reasons that we don't understand between this point and as of our cool some three hundred years later, this is the eleventh ever chosen. Um, and all part of Bellacor's plan because he intends to possess, become the ever chosen, rise up as the fifth chaos power, and effectively go to war with the other chaos gods because he is Malal. Um, the great god Malal made manifest in a different way. For those of you who know your ancient lore, there used to be five chaos powers, not four. And the fifth one was called Malal, which was dropped for a variety of reasons in the past. And Belakor is a direct replacement for the whole concept of Malal, chaos that fights chaos. Um, and is a fun, exciting, interesting version, which in different people's hands has both been brilliant and not so brilliant because he's often played for pratfalls um, in some of the lore, much as uh, lore master Sotek has suggested. They have almost, they almost like making fun of him or using him as a character to show how powerful their good guy is. Um, so they'll show how powerful their good guy is by having the good guy beat Bellacor, who everyone knows is ridiculously powerful. It's a little bit like in Star Trek, that whenever they wanted to show someone was physically powerful, they just beat up Worf with that character. Yeah, or the Avatar of Kane in 40k. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. Um, poor Avatar of Kane. Yeah. I mean, everything kills the Avatar of Kane. Um, and uh, Bellacor is to a degree on that same receiving end of punishment. Um, but the plan that he has for more time almost, almost yeah. pulls off. So to, to break it down, Bellicor, a lot of Bellicor's plans actually tend to revolve around possessing an Ever Chosen. That's usually his kind of go-to strategy. Um, and part of it because is... Because it's loosely what he was originally. Yeah, yeah, part of it is that for him, it's kind of a revenge system of that he is... The Dark Gods are assholes, and they very much deliberately gave him the job of... Be Bellicor is intimately involved with every Ever Chosen because he has to crown them. He's the only one that can get to the crown of okay. domination and put it on their heads. That is literally his job. Um, his curse. He, yeah, his, his curse. curse. Yeah, and he <laughs> hates not happy it, it because <laughs> they're literally doing the one thing he wants, and the dark gods are like, ah, making fun of him. So he constantly is trying to possess that person, A, because it's a clever move in the sense that it's so close to his goal. All he has to do is put himself in that guy's body and possess him, and he's right where he wants to be. Um, and once he has that form and he's off the crown and everything, he's basically unstoppable. But pulling off that little bit this is uh, probably one of the most heartbreaking moments for Bellacor because he he pulls it off. He does it. He full on possesses Cardoon uh, successfully. He manages to lure him to more time, which is very impressive. And also, I think very interestingly might suggest how uh, much of a unique ever chosen Cardoon might have been in that he seems to have been a very stealthy and clever individual as opposed to kind of the typical big warlord uh, type figure. There was something a lot more sinister about Cardoon. But Cardoon gets lured into Mordheim one way or another, and Bellicor manages to get him into position and fully possesses him. Like he invades him, gets all of his essence into Cardoon. He manages to break Cardoon's will, takes over his body, and is like, finally, finally. And he's a, he's a, basically a god, and he goes, All right, I'm going to begin my conquest. And he starts trying to leave Mordheim. And it doesn't go well because the second he gets out of a certain distance from the, where the uh, the meteor impacted and his essence was kind of bound to the physical realm, his body starts to break down. Because what Bellacor did not realize that Zinch kind of pulled off is that Bellacor is so big, so bad, so powerful that Cardoon's body physically cannot handle him being in it without a crazy amount of like magic warp stone, warp stone to sustain <laughs> yeah. him. Yeah, so if he leaves the city, he will die and he will go back to fading into shadow. And Bellicor goes, fuck, God damn it. <laughs> and he turns around and marches back into the city because he can't leave. He's stuck. But in his mind, he turns and looks at the very substance he used to lure in Cardoon and is luring in everybody else and goes, if I get enough of this, maybe I can either augment this body enough 
or I can at least have enough to have like kind of a moving power station in a sense where I can leave the city. So suddenly now he is also joining the rat race to get as much of this weird stone that he brought in the first place because now he needs it. And this is a material that it like people have been grabbing and looting and like literally everybody is showing up. The Skaven are showing up because they're like, oh shit, this is a warp stone with even more properties, even more power, even more goodies that we can use. Clan Eshin in particular being a huge force in play. Um, the Von Karsteins heavily involved. Vlad is building up to his kind of grand reveal. And for anyone that kind of knows the lore behind Vlad Von Karstein, his big ritual that kicks off the, war the vampire wars needs a unspeakable amount of warp stone. Um, in order to pull off because his grand plan to start things off is basically to cast a ritual that awakens all the dead of Sylvania, which is not a small task. That is a pretty fucking huge spell. Uh, and he knows he's going to need so much warp stone. And conveniently, not only is this kind of almost super warp stone, but it all landed right in his backyard. More time is right fucking there. So vampires start pouring into the city. And it's not just Von Karsteins. Like, Von Karsteins are kind of the main playable faction. But you know every single other bloodline was drawn to this, too. Of the Necrarchs, they want all in on that. Lamians, there's a lot of political powers and schemes going on, and Neferata wants to be involved. Blood Dragons are showing up because rumors about all these different mercenary bands and horrifying monsters appearing in the city, that's going to draw them in. And poor... <laughs> the poor... Um, uh ushorans get they they just unfortunately those poor bastards just show up everywhere but uh so now you have massive amounts of the undead showing up you have massive amounts of skaven showing up all the other chaos powers there are people being drawn by bellicor's whispers now because he needs cultists he needs agents he needs warriors he needs, he needs more demons because he needs more and so not only now is he brought uh drawing in people that are greedy and He's now trying to get those people to fall to him. Uh, this is why if you're playing in uh, Warhammer 3, Bellacor, I, I don't like that they've done this, but I understand why they kind of, though it's also due to some limitations, things. he has kind of a warrior of chaos angle in that he has a lot of mortal followers because he can offer a lot of power, a lot of so, uh, other sinister things. So as not to get too caught up in Bellacor, although yes. I'm about to say more on it, <laughs> um it, because his story is intrinsically linked to Mordheim. Um, to look back at Belakor's origins, we're looking at the very first demon prince. So this is the very first person that the chaos power is elevated, and they all channeled a certain amount of their power into him. And he rose up and came to rule the northern tribes up in the north. Mm -hmm. Um, he became not just powerful during the very first cataclysm, the great wars of Paeus, he became arguably the central part of of their power in the Wallerhammer world. There goes Anonymous. So I guess copying the gash with the warp stone. No, he did it first. Um, yeah, see, he, yeah, uh, yeah. He, all the way up at the north of the world, um, he he was in bathing in the warped energies that were coming from the portal. And he swole to as such an extraordinary power that he had thousands of demons that um, were under him hundreds of thousands of worshippers that were about most of the power what the demons and forces that wandered the world from the north were his they didn't come from the four great powers of chaos they were his but because of the very nature of what they were doing the demons that were around him rose in power became full demon princes much like him and that fragmented all the power that was around that to a degree made him a bit weaker and to make matters even worse, when he realized this and all the demon princes went to war with each other, because he went to war with all the other demon princes for daring to try and take any of his power. So those who were once with him are now going to war with him. That was the war that gave the elves the opportunity to create the great vortex, suck magic out of the world, which made poor old Belacor that relied on that magic for his existence to wink out. And he was yeah. cast out to the realms of chaos. And this is what he was attempting to avoid here down in more time. He's attempting to break free of the realms of chaos where he had been trapped. He was attempting to physically manifest in the real world. That's why all the warp stone is all over the place and it's being gathered up like crazy to empower him. He just didn't realize quite how much of the stuff he'd need and that the possession would not be enough.
Um, so mm. yeah, yeah, Bellicor, he's he's very interestingly one of the characters who is very undone. He's not undone by weakness. Ironically, he's undone because he's too powerful. Too powerful. Yeah, like he underestimated how powerful he is. Um, which is kind of a weird phrase, but it it is what happened to him. Uh, and in this instance, but um, when when looking at Mordheim uh, specifically, um, so the Shadow Lord, you whenever you do anything involving Mordheim, he gets brought up a lot because he is he's the main baddie, he's the big bad, and he is. Uh, there's there's a lot of characters that talk about his presence lurking at the center of the city, where people who are blessed with the ability to perceive the winds of magic uh you know often called second sight or even people who have holy visions and things like that they can sense something at the center of mordheim this black abyss of just so much power and dar that it's it's almost incomprehensible to the extent that if you had characters that were of a particularly not strong will you could have wizards that could go insane just trying to approach mordheim and witnessing bellicor's power because mm -hmm. that's how dangerous of a threat has arrived in the Empire. I will say, though, just to make sure that our timeline is clear, that um, this is not what Bellicor was when he first arrived. When Bellicor first arrives, he's an insubstantial, effectively a demon. He's the shadowy master that lies behind mm -hmm. it all. Um, and as everyone is piling into more time in an attempt to grab various bits of weird stone, wherever they may be having, and most of the time just tearing into each other in the most horrendous fashion he is not this great demon that's sitting over it all going ho 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 um uh he's quite literally a shadow master behind the scenes um the ever chosen has yet to arrive he hasn't tried to possess him yet mm. um he is gathering power to himself so that he can hopefully manifest and properly uh, free himself from all the curses that the chaos gods have placed upon him now was he a part of the chaos god schemes Yes, but was there a chance that he could break free? Yes. Um, the Chaos Gods are fickle creatures, as we all know. He gained his power from them in the first place, after all. So um, don't think of him as this great demon that's sitting there um, in the heart of uh, Mordheim, being looked at by everyone like he's sitting on the horizon, yeah, 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 like a yeah. great video game demon it, that it, we it's all at the, Yeah, it's at the end of the, the kind of song. Because Mordheim, the, the events of it take about, I want to say it's like two... Like one or two decades ish. Yeah, it, it's not short, and it's fair to say that it's not really resolved for three hundred years. When Magnus the Pious is the one who comes along and breaks what the uh, curses, shall we say, that sit upon more time. But in many respects, don't don't even fix it. Then all he does is <laughs> um uh, shatter time in many respects. And it's not until Gotrek and Felix come along later, all the way up in twenty five hundred, that um, more time finally is to a degree broken. Um, that's covered in one of the good old Gotrek and Felix stories. Yes, yeah, City of the Damned. Uh, yeah. Fun book, and also a really, 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 really important story if you want to read all the way to the very, very end because it literally sets up the final two books. Does. But um, so we so we've talked a fair bit about Bellicor. And once again, it, it's worth talking about that. Uh, he is he's almost uh, in seen as a pop up and say this one just so um, everybody knows. Yes, it normally would be Sunday, but I was down in London. I apologize to everyone last uh, Sunday, so I couldn't do the cast, but I am here today. Yeah, so it, yeah, you can kind of, it's not a bonus episode, but if you want to think of it as a bonus episode because it's on Thursday, there you go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But, um, but, uh, and it's worth, Bellicor was not acting alone. Like he, uh, like Andy said, he was not able to possess a body until fairly late in the Mordheim saga of that kind of that like main series of early decades. And because of that, he needed agents. He had, and so this is where his cultists come in, his chaos sorcerers, these individuals who, so, very few of whom probably were followers of his before uh, he arrived, but many of whom converted. Of uh, mm -hmm. people who, either due to madness or desperation, end up joining the shadow, the dark master, um, falling under his sway because of his promises. Whether he promises power or in some really tragic scenarios, promising things that he probably would not actually have followed through on, such as if you work <laughs> for me, I'll get rid of your mutations or you know what? I'll bring back your lost loved ones or you know what? I will uh, give you some other like thing that you want. Like, I'll, oh, you've got a horrible disease. I can cure that for you. Oh, you like you want to. 
uh, help feed your children or whatever. I've got, I'm a practically our, our master has infinite wealth. He has infinite power. Just come surf in. And if you prove yourself to him, then you will get whatever you want. And the dark master becomes one of the kind of the major forces within the Mordheim setting and a very prominent one of the war bands because Bellacore is almost kind of this whirlpool uh, that's luring in the desperate and depraved who for whatever reasons are working for him. And this leads to a lot of people even more coming to the city and falling under some really horrible sway. Um, and some really nasty figures show up to work for Bellacore. Mm. Cause like Andy said of that, he has his own demons, many of whom start manifesting within the city because they it's do. so tainted by um, uh, Weirdstone that they can just appear. Um, this it's is also worth stating that that's th that started happening before the comet even arrived. When the cavorting was happening, the cultists had gathered to worship underneath the arriving comet. Demons were already sleeping out from behind the crevices and popping up, and all manner of awfulness was occurring inside that city. So it's uh, almost like the demons knew what was to come. The rise of magic was, after all, ridiculous. It was a it was an end times event. Um, if you want to look at it from the perspective of overall lore, this is where we have our Storm of Magic very much being the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from the Storm of Magic books, if you go take a look at those, magic is going wild and it is centering on more time and it changes more time to its core. Um, like the Great Oak that sits yeah. in the corner of it. Oh, I was just about to bring Wait. that up. Yeah, there yeah. we go. You go for it then. <laughs> yeah, so the Great Oak, which is uh, one of the new landmark buildings we got in Total War Warhammer 3, and it's really fun. Where if you're if you're playing as either the like Wood the Elves Oak. or as Bella, any of the Chaos factions, you can build the Great Oak. And depending on if you're a Wood Elf or a Chaos faction, it does different things, which is hilarious uh, because you have the Wood Elves showing up trying to tame this tree, which is just such a funny mental image to me. But the Great Oak, so you may not realize it based on the landmark description how fucking terrifying the Great Oak is. This tree uh, was already a beautiful, large, epic great oak that stands over the western gatehouse of Mordheim. It was mm -hmm. practically a symbol of the city because of how grand and beautiful it was. But Weirdstone, uh, Warpstone, uh, changed the tree. And it got bigger. And <laughs> it also started growing deeper into the gatehouse and beneath the city. And it became... Um, it got mouths and tendrils and tentacles. Glowing and red eyes. And eyes. <laughs> And yep. uh, it became the Great Oak uh, less of a symbol of good and more a symbol of absolute nightmare horrors in the sense that this thing is well over 100 feet tall on the outside. Um, if you actually go into the depths of Mordheim, such as into the sewers or the gatehouse itself, you realize it's significantly larger than that. And the thing about it is it is very alive and moving around. It goes, it goes on a rampage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it goes on a literal rampage. It uproots itself and goes on a wander. And yeah, it's, it's hungry. It's very <laughs> yeah. hungry. And it eats a lot of people. Um, it is debatably one of the deadliest things that's in the city. Uh, in that, like, there's a whole note about it. Bellacor and the desperate. <laughs> You know, well, that yeah, that was basically Bellacore during the Great Incursion with all the other demon princes. Uh, also, I'd like to just take this small moment halfway through to say um, thank you very much for everyone who's been dropping in super comments. And if you're out there thinking, would I like to make a super comment? I would just like to pose you this particular question. Would you like to help poor old lore master of Sotek fix his car? If you don't know, he crashed <laughs> lately. And by the gods, did he take a ton of damage. And I don't just mean in terms of the car, but in terms of the wallet. So if you're out there thinking, would I like to? Today's the days to do it because our good friend lore master is suffering financial car woes. I know he won't say it, so I've said it. He's, now, moving on swiftly. I, uh, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. You just embarrass um, him in the corner there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, the Great Oak, um, monstrous, horrible thing. And just kind of to put the mental image, because we're really celebrating Spooky Month, there are um, there are notes within uh, the Mordheim lore. Oh, so okay. This is, this is something I know people... Uh, thank you, Hammond. Uh, people have been asking me to bring up just because... I don't know if you'll laugh at it or not. So for those of you that enjoy Stormcast Eternals, yes, Balthagar Gelt is a Stormcast Eternal. <laughs> He's called Balthus Arum now. <laughs> he does come up. Um, uh, oh, oh. Yeah, so even better, Andy. He survived the end times. Aren't you thrilled? <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> but um, in any event... Of course he did. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, in any event, um, what is, uh, so the great Oak to put in how horrific this thing is and what people encountered is that Mordheim is such a shitty place that a lot of people very often, not correctly would assume that the most dangerous part of the city surely had the most wealth. That's where the most weird stone must be is wherever the most dangerous area is. Or you know what? I hear that there's a big treasure stash in the Western gatehouse. If you just go in there, apparently there's like all the treasure in the world because people try, try to keep going in there. And what actually happens is if you tried to go into the Western gatehouse, you would see the great Oak at a distance and think, Oh, we'll just be quiet. We're safe. And you get down in there into the dark where there's no light and you might, and you wouldn't see anything at first. And as you get in, you'd hear the sound of creaking wood and then look and there would be vines grown over the exit behind you and then eyes would start opening and you would be surrounded by thousands of tendrils made from fleshy wood-like substance that are covered in eyes, mouths, fangs that just start croaching in on you and there's no escape and you're going to die. Like nobody ever managed to until I think Magnus came much, much later, the great Oak survived. <laughs> Thanks, Laughing God. Thanks very much for the chat. A gold mask cockroach. <laughs> Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm, Thank I'm, you just going, I'm just going to remove the word roach from that. Um, <laughs> let's move on to Camilla. <laughs> A vampire uh, kicks also get a landmark for the oak. Um, it gives a faction wide regeneration to bats. Love how they oh, that's that awesome. I didn't know the vampire Good counts got it as well. Stuff. And thank you very much, Camilla. Super appreciated. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, landmarks are some of my favorite things. Uh, I feel bad for the CA staff because I actually, I literally have a like almost Microsoft Excel thing that I send them on a very regular basis, being in like, y'all should add these things to these cities and these things to these cities. And they're like, please stop. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, so um what uh so that's the great oak but it was not the only monstrosity um it's the most famous but there the city was uh essentially carved up into different districts uh some of them fell under particular powers most were essentially just no man lands where the various powers would kind of go in grab what they couldn't leave um but we've kind of talked a bit about uh, the Skaven, who are fairly obvious, and there wasn't anything I think particularly unique about what they were there to do, other than just gather warpstone. Not <laughs> warpstone. Yeah. yeah, but I do think it would be time uh, talking about the actual different uh, imperial groups, uh, most mm -hmm. notably the ones from the three different um, main powers of Marienburg, um, uh, Talabakland, or the Attilans, and then the uh, Reich Reichlanders, um, which was a fucking mess. Because these people um, were truly the greedy and the desperate. Like, there were some bad people that showed up, but, like, the regular humans that showed up were, they did some pretty awful shit <laughs> in the hopes of kind of just making it big. Um, and a lot of that involved horribly murdering each other. Yeah. So, um, let's uh, move it on a, a few weeks to months after this impact has occurred. We've got ourselves a hellscape of a city um, where everything is turning against everyone that's within it. Those few survivors that managed to eke out some form of existence within there have mutated, become something strange. There's stories of giant rack-like creatures stalking through the old ruined streets. There's monsters and mutants. There's tentacles coming out of the river. It's really awful in there, but the siren call of this weird stone is enough to drag people from across the empire as it's its enormous utility becomes increasingly more clear and nobody wants anyone else to have its benefit. They want it thus for themselves. If, for example, you were the wolf emperor sitting up in Middenheim, you'd look down there and go, wait a minute, how come they're getting all this shit? We need to get this shit too. Send some fellows down. The Ottilan Emperor up um, uh, up in Talapine Talib goes, yes, yes, we need some of that too. Um, or if you're Magritte sitting all the way over in Marienburg, you're like, yes, we can't let them have it. We need to have it. So people start arriving from across not just the old world, but pretty much everywhere because this stuff is really powerful. And 
there's an awful lot of backstabbing going on to get access to this. People come from everywhere and surrounding the city, this enormous shanty town slowly but surely develops. In the heart of it are the Sisters of Sigmar, in the heart of the city itself, where their seers still doing their thing. They hold the Electra Count's blade in there because they somehow got it. It got smuggled over towards their abbey during the last events before the destruction of the entire city. Many view them as the great betrayers. How did they survive? They must be aligned to the mm. dark gods themselves. The ruinous powers have protected them. They are the problem. So those who are their natural allies, perhaps other Sigmarites, the Grand Theogenist himself sitting back in Altdorf, suddenly looks at this and goes, yeah, no, they are wrong and they need to be brought down. And they're sitting there holding on to what is one of the great symbols of imperial authority, a runefang being held in the center of this holy site right in the center of Mortheim itself. And all around it is hell, but hell that is full, full of the equivalent to giant piles of gold but even more expensive and more useful than gold because it can turn anything into gold. It is the time of times and everybody, as we know, as we've said, it's a desperate era where everybody is already on the edge of their acceptable, let's say, positions in life. They do horrible things already. And now they've got this extraordinary uh, hope sitting in front of them. They can get rich. They can finally get something good out of this. And as we've said, the majority of the people that arrive uh, out in the shanty towns, it's not so bad. But once they get in, it's cutthroat. And the majority that enter never get out. Yeah. And it's worth even saying that the, the real tragedy is there are a lot of people who are sent against their wills. Oh, yeah. Uh, for more time. Of you have people that... Uh, you have some forces, especially within the Empire, who are so desperate that it's not even like they're just sending mercenaries, but it's also like they're arresting people. And mm -hmm. you essentially have like these um, people get enslaved and sent to the city and told, tell you what, we will we will let you go and we'll forgive whatever crime that you may or may not have actually committed if you bring us X amount of weird stone. Like if you go into the city, get some weird stone, come back, we'll let you go home. And it's, it's, this, yeah. And it's, it's an awful, awful situation. And you even have uh, other forces knowing how deadly the city is and also using that as a form of political advantage where there are people being sent to the city who are very specifically sent there to die. Um, and yep. given that false promise, that false hope of all you have to do is this job and, you know, Oh, you know, if you're in like a wolf emperor and you're like, oh, there's these like really fervent Sigmarites that are hanging out in the city that are protesting and they're being kind of annoying. You know what? Let's send them to more time. Mm -hmm. oh, and mm -hmm. you have like a lot of you have some places that are going, you know what? Oh, we've got these beggars or these poor people that we don't want to deal with. We don't want to have to take care of them. Let's just send them to more time. They can, <laughs> they, they can, they can <laughs> find their wealth there. They, they could they could change their lives around. But entire civilization and um, almost society starts building up around this ex-capital of um, the empire. Now, the destruction of Mordheim almost, by extension, destroys Ostermark. Um, the entirety of its upper-level nobility is almost wiped out in a single night. So huge swathes of what was once a standard, almost feudalized um, land no longer has any of its lords in place. The uh, lands are already polluted with the storm of magic that's going on with mutation, with troubles, and it gets anything much, much worse. I mean, it's almost like having a big warpstone comet hit and spread all of its awfulness is a bad thing. What? Um, but <laughs> Ostermark as a whole collapses as a place and will eventually become the League of Ostermark far later, although in some versions it was always a league, depending upon which version of the background you read. Um, but for the actual place itself, um, it's not just that people came from across the empire. Back uh, back in the day, when they were playing the game back in 1999 into 2000 into 2001, there was a magazine called The Town Crier. And The Town Crier was a collection of articles for different types of gangs that could go down there, different kinds of monsters um, that might exist, different creatures that you could hire. And when I say that they really did tour the world, they did. There's rules in there for Amazons piling through. Yeah, Lizardmen. The 
Great Wizard feet. Wizard then going through uh, Mordheim looking for their good old gold. They did obviously a host of. Surely there's a sacred plaque here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, totally. Somewhere. They, they did. They did versions of the rules which were designed to be played, say, for example, over in Lustria or designed yes. to be played um, in the uh, search for the Nemesis Crown or some other parts. But loosely speaking, there's rules in there for Dark Elves very much looking for their own versions of the Warpstone in there, for High Elves doing their thing. There's Cathayans in there doing their thing. There's entire carnivals worth of folk just coming in and doing oh, their God, stuff. We have, okay, we have to talk about that. There's some here. pretty proper, crazy... Um, amounts of involvement from across the Warhammer world in this one location. And it makes, from someone who's a role player, a perfect place for role play as well, because it is quite literally the place where adventuring bands go to make their fortune. Yeah, it should it should really kind of have well, and one of the things I actually think this bears a moan of actually talking about the tabletop game itself. Of uh, the Mordheim tabletop game was so deep is so deeply beloved and fascinating because it's not just an action or adventure or strategy game it's a role play game you build a war band that lasts for weeks of like real time play um, months yeah months yeah of <laughs> like and it's it's a fascinating experience of you like you're hiring people and you're setting them up with equipment it was very very detailed as far as like every individual piece of your body you could have different pieces of armor uh, you could have all sorts of different weapons uh, and they came with upsides and downsides. You had like fascinating line of sight rules. You were playing with verticality. You were jumping across rooftops or moving across really like dangerous forms of terrain, trying to come around corners and surprise and manipulate your opponents. And it was a fascinating game. That was awesome. But there was so much role play to it because, yeah. because you had a persistent war band. You would build up these characters, name them, create a little backstory for them, and play a mission. And then somebody would get wounded, and while they'd escape, oh no, they lost an arm, or they lost a leg, so they got a peg leg now, or like they <laughs> they lost an eye. And there were rules for if you lost a body part, how would that affect your character? Oh, you lost a hand? Well, you've got these debuffs now, but you're a little better at dodging because you're lighter. <laughs> or, hey, you <clears throat> lost a leg while well, your movement, your agility are worse, but you've got kind of this other kind of interesting thing. And it allowed you to have a lot of really fun, dynamic stories. Um, yes. Yeah, so for those of you who know your old Warhammer Lord, you'll know the idea of the war band style of play had been going on almost since the beginning of Warhammer. It got introduced heavily through the course of third edition Warhammer when you had the Realms of Chaos books. And in there, you got the war band rules for building up your own war bands, pitching them against each other to try and impress the Chaos Gods and take your champion and get that champion towards Demon Princedom Hood before. They became Spawn. Um, and that was the whole concept of the Warband rules. That had been taken and completely revised and turned into Confrontation and then Necromunda for 40k. Mm -hmm. And the Necromunda game was enormously popular. But obviously, for those of us who were Warhammer fans primarily, it was always that game over there that I might have bought four sets of and played pretty much <laughs> end to end all the time. But let's Let's just not discuss that part. Um, I loved Necromunda, but the idea of a Warhammer version of Necromunda, a game where you had that campaign setting where you were going taking your warband and developing it game by game by game, and importantly for Necromunda, the whole point of its town crier, telling a story. Telling a story within the setting. It was a game that was almost designed to have a GM sitting over it, telling a story for the whole campaign. And the story of Necromunda, no, Necromunda, pardon me, the story of Mordheim as we know it, is effectively the studio campaign with Belakor, the shadowy master behind it all, attempting to realize its true potential. And that's the story that became the story of Mordheim. So the very nature of the role-playing, if you wish, although it's not strictly a role-playing game, it's more of a narrative board storytelling board game. Yeah. Um, but this uh, this warband style war game, I suppose, equally, um, became not just the story of the game, but was also influential in how they pitched it to everyone else to try and get you to tell your own story. As I said, um, there was the whole concept of the Child of Light, the uh, ever-chosen's opposite sitting on the other side as well. Um, and that got moved over towards the Champion of Light, and they even gave rules for that much, much later, for the first child that was born with it, for, from the Sisters of Sigmar. Um, the entire stories that would become the end time stories that we would come to know and 
no at a later date. I didn't want to say no in love, but certainly no and no. Many of the core concepts were interlaced and created for more time because of the stories that were told as their bands at the studio and everybody's thought about how cool it was and sitting around uh, discussing what they could do to make it further. So they had their genesis here. Um, and the end of the world setting that was what more time and the real idea that the setting could have ended then that was it. It was the end times. The whole, the end is nigh, it's coming. It's very much more time to its soul and later on the end times. As it is, pardon me, there's yeah. Hot Light. Hot Light. Thank you for a very, very generous super chat. Thank you so you much. Rock. Thank you so Tuition much. Tuition for Warhammer History 101. God, man, I wish that was a... I, I, I would love <laughs> If there's anyone that ever needs that, I I would... Yes, Professor Sotek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep the great work. You guys are equipping me to GM and write. I am thrilled to hear that. Always happy when someone else is getting like into doing stuff with all of this knowledge and telling so, stories and introducing more people and yes yeah, Bellacor is absolutely to blame for the car accident. so I'm, I'm going to since you did such a generous one i will say that Bellacor is a source a, a true source of extraordinary warhammer tales um because he is the forgotten fifth power of chaos and um the one that the chaos gods themselves created and are afraid of because of what he could potentially become, i.e. their peer. They don't want that. Assuming that you ascribe anything close to a natural sentience and having hopes and desires to a chaos entity. But if you do, they do not want that. Their greater demons certainly don't want that. And Belakor is that and is interlaced throughout the entirety of the Warhammer world towards the end time. So if you are playing a game of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, ain't now wrong with using Bellacore to the point that um, we, our guest on our last episode, Gav Thorpe, uh, he and I, our adventure was pretty much focused around for his first book on Bellacore. Exactly what was happening over in Albion, where Bellacore mm -hmm. will rise again, not for this stream. Um, and why it's such a key component towards the Warhammer world and what it eventually becomes. So yeah, a super important character. I would argue in terms of its influence upon the world, much more important than Nagash. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but much more because Belakor made Archeon. Belakor pretty much created the end times. The whole thing is a plan by Belakor. Mm. The Warhammer world ending was because of Belakor. Now, it might have gone beyond Bellacor's intention, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't Bellacor that kicked it all off. Nagash was at the whims of Bellacor's plans. So, loosely, just to say thank you very much, yes, do use Bellacor, an extraordinary character that has had its ups and downs, but is definitely worth plumbing into. Uh, hey, bye, but thank you very much for the uh, the the bits. <laughs> Uh, Bellacor couldn't be behind the car that actually happened and went to plan. Now, the insurance afterwards <laughs> that was Bellacor, yeah. Uh, that's a that's a very accurate way to put it. No, that was, that was yeah, Zinch fucking with the uh, <laughs> god, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, no, correct. Um, but uh, <laughs> so okay, we've talked. Um, getting back to the actual lore of Mordheim, one of the factions, oh, yeah, more time, <laughs> yeah, one of the factions, uh, we have to talk about for a little bit just because they are so unique. And a lot of people don't know about how fun they are in kind of like a horrible sense. We have to talk about the Carnival of Chaos. Ah, the good old Carnival of Chaos. You do like the Carnival of Chaos. The dreaded Carnival of Chaos. Okay, away you go. Go for it. Yeah, so uh, my... Uh, so oh, I will say one thing, actually. Just one thing. I do not like that they used the word gypsy um, to describe the Carnival of Chaos, um, which they did. They should have used Strigony or some equivalent. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be great. Because Gypsy wouldn't really be a term in the Warhammer world. Um, uh, indeed. Anyway. So, well, <laughs> for those of you who are going and reading it afterwards, just replace the word Gypsy with, say, Strigony. It'll work much better. Yeah. So uh, the Carnival of Chaos. You know, a lot of people, when they think about chaos, they tend to think, where is chaos? Big, like, either heavy metal Vikings Norskins, Kurgan, or dudes in huge heavy plate armor, uh, horrible like monsters and stuff like that. But there is another side to chaos. Um, there, there is, there's the fun side, the party side, <laughs> which is, uh, quite frankly, the Carnival, who were a very major faction um, within Mordheim. They were not usually Bellacor's guys. They were usually an outside force, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit. But the Carnival of Chaos, though they do still exist today in the setting, they don't get talked about nearly as much as they should. 
But the Carnival of Chaos is functionally the concept of there are some people who come to embrace chaos and everything that comes with it, where instead of them being mutated and they fall into despair or they become like full on hardcore chaos worshipers or whatever, they kind of look at and go, well, we might as well indulge ourselves. We might as well cut ourselves free from the society that's going to burn us alive or is going to hang us or shoot us or whatever. And what if instead we embrace what makes us unique? We embrace what makes us different and we have a party. Now there are forces within the carnival of chaos who have more sinister moves um, and uh, look more to actually get the carnival to go to specific places to cause chaos and havoc. Um, Giancarlo Bellacor Esposito. <laughs> That's a name. You guys get undone by Skaven. I get undone by myself. We are not the same. <laughs> undone by Zinch, please. Per undone me. by Zinch, yeah. Um, Bella <laughs> Bella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, thank you, Hammond. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, but the Carnival of Chaos, um, it, they are a fascinating group where it is kind of what it sounds like on the 10 of that a carnival comes into town, a carnival shows up, they have tents, they have performers, they have all sorts of cool exotic things, and they're very friendly, they're very gregarious and welcome you in. They're very they and they're kind of like a big family, and they're so happy to see you. And they invite people to come watch uh, shows, the likes of which you won't see anywhere else. Amazing performances by people who may look a little strange or be able to do things that people shouldn't be able to do. But surely it's just an impressive trick. Surely it's just actors. And they're not actually weird abominations. Uh, they Dedicated have, to Nurgle. Yeah. Yes. Nurgle is very strongly themed, especially with the Carnival of Chaos. And uh and they perform this big, great show, and they thank everyone. They take money, and then they vanish very, very quickly and always before the authorities show up. And unfortunately for the people that often they perform for, very, very bad things tend to follow in the carnival's wake, uh, whether it be disease, mutation. Uh, Something or, wicked this week comes, the yes. inspiration there. Or you think you witnessed what may have been a harmless performance, but it was actually a ritual. Uh, or it was actually uh, what we know kind of thanks to kind of modern horror as a cognito hazard, something that merely by hearing it or seeing it, it introduces a seed of corruption into your psyche. Um, and you'll and it's it's a very sinister force because on the surface, it is so friendly. It is so jolly. They seem like the kind of people that would take in orphans and give them a life on the road. Uh, but the more you delve into them and you kind of look behind what they're actually up to, they are a deeply sinister group. Yeah, the Twisted Masquerade of the Carnival is quite fun. Um, it's something that gets picked up with and reused by the role-playing game in a variety of different places. And again, almost always associated with Nurgle all the way through the pestilence that comes along with them. And as I said earlier, quite strongly uh, inspired by something wicked this way comes. Um, that idea of the traveling show bringing horror along with it and leaving a uh, bomb site behind as they move on and it, it makes for a really fun uh role-playing situation for those of you who are playing the role-play game out there as well because that traveling group um is is just super fun and super sinister um anyone who's watched any horror show that goes into one of those carnivals will know exactly what to expect um because they are all <laughs> espoused within it um and the carnival master himself sitting at the top almost certainly a sorcerer of some power who is attempting to bring corruption around them but more time grabs the carnival of chaos to it and it becomes part of the ongoing story of the uh corruption that comes along with it and as i recall it's pretty closely associated with nurgle all the way through too mm -hmm. um and um I, I i adore it just as a setup it was a really nice one and as i recall mike brunton now he wrote the original wrote chunks of the original uh realms of chaos books mike brunton wrote an article for traveling carnivals um which we were updating for the fourth edition uh, Mike Brunton was going to be the editor in all of the uh, Enemy Within, actually. Unfortunately, he sadly died. Mike is a great guy. Mm. You sadly missed Mike. I salute thee. Um, and uh, 
that idea has come up again and again and again in Warhammer and th with chaos. The idea of this chaos that is brought in and then moved on. Several Warhammer comics in Warhammer Monthly, for example, did the same idea. The idea of this traveling show that would bring chaos and leave nothing but chaos in its wake, uh, presenting itself as if it was somehow acceptable and jolly. That idea of running away with the uh, circus, so to speak, mm. became nothing more than joining the chaos cult and being responsible for the fall of someone at the next town. Yeah, they're super fun and do like them. Yeah, I actually, this way comes. yeah, I would actually say this. This also really, I think, heavily is what cemented the idea in a lot of people's minds about Nurgle followers being the happy, jolly. Uh, laughing individuals in a lot of ways that are yeah, that, very that, welcoming. That's right at the very beginning because um, the whole concept of Nurgle is uh, that that despair that often causes the fall um, as you look upon the horror that's been inflicted, the body horror that's been inflicted upon you and learning to accept that and that uh, think of the uh, giggling, gurgling, nurglings that are bouncing along, happily um, moving into Papa Nurgle, who's sitting up there, oh, 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 big Papa Nurgle as well, defying the despair that the very god represents himself. That jolliness, that happiness that stands in counterpoint to say, for example, the plague bearers, who are all sitting there almost mindlessly lost to their despair as they drone their way through counting every single last disease that's ever been created and hopefully not losing their point and having to go back to number one again as you hear the drone of the plague bearers coming mm. 3428 3429 um plague bearers are super fun as well but yes nurgle has got and always has had almost since the first introduction of the god um past first edition um fantasy role play but most certainly when he was in third edition warhammer um that jolly aspect um the uh beasts of nurgle as they were back then big slug-like entities with tentacles pouring out of their heads and as they were back then they were almost enthusiastic puppies they come yep. bounding up towards you and they'd lap away at you with their big huge tonguey mouths and they would spread corruption and disease as they leave a big slime trail behind them and anything that passes that trail catches nurgle's rot turns into a play bear it's fucking awful um but yes it's always gone hand in hand with nurgle and i think works really well for that idea of the circus because you get these the, those who are both lost to despair um, because you get almost that idea of the act that are trapped and there's nothing that they can do bounced off against the jolly ringmaster or some equivalent and those who are bringing you in super fun yeah and mordheim really dials it up to 11 where you have this oh, hell blasted yes. landscape that's awful and like there's nothing of joy to be found and yet Except in parts of the city chaos. there's a carnival going on and it's a grand party i actually read a uh, hammer and bolter uh, short story which like god i wish they still did those wow. they're very that's a while ago yeah uh, i was reading a short story that's about more time and in the story you have a group of characters that are trying to avoid a carnival of chaos and it's horrific how it's described that from the carnival's perspective it's a joyous parade through these this particular section of Mordheim, and there's hundreds of them. It's this, it's most of it is like these almost shambling zombie, these plague victims who are horribly diseased, and all they can do is just shamble and groan and follow after the carnival master who's just having a wonderful time calling people, come, come on, the carnival, come participate. And if they <laughs> see someone, he's like, Look, someone new to join the festivities, and all of a sudden this horde gets very active like they start running chasing after the person they see scrambling up the the architecture through the buildings jumping through the windows and that's just mm -hmm. the people then like the a beast of nurgle comes bounding to greet you with horrible acids and poisons and diseases being flecked off where if you get even a little bit on it you're probably going to get infected with nurgle's rot which is one of the most horrific fucking diseases I have ever read about in any fictional setting. It sucks because even if you die, there's, there's no escape. Even death will not save you. Um, and so the carnival is, it, it's a fascinating faction within Mordheim because they have such a juxtaposition of, they increase the horror, but it's like, if you saw them from a distance, it would be easy to mistake them as something to head towards something to lure you in of, Oh, thank God there's people. Oh, thank God there's laughter and merriment. And then when you get close enough to actually see them, you realize, oh, no, I need to get the fuck away from these guys, like, as fast as possible. Yeah. 
So um, I think we're at a good point to say that, loosely speaking, we have got ourselves a hellhole of an ex-city that is surrounded by the politics of not just the empire, but the world, who have become focused on this central locus point. A central locus point that has been created for an end goal. It is the Dark Master, it is the Shadow Chap, sitting behind it all, pulling at the strings, attempting to break itself free from the chaos powers that have wrapped it up in this web of curses and madness. And it's a trying to slip free from this. And it's doing so by the very warp stone that it rolled down on. If you could imagine him sitting there, sitting on the back of a comet. Um, he's Cowboy pretty much... In India. Um, his essence is in every last piece of the warp stone that is spread across the city. And he's gathering that essence back together. And uh, his essence is also arguably what makes the warp stone there a bit different. It's what allows it to to be more approachable, so to speak, because it is a physical manifestation of this ancient entity uh, that has changed the entirety of not just the Warpstone, but the city and the world's politics as it becomes a central locus point for everything. And eventually, it reaches the point where the good old Dark Master can rise, the Ever Chosen comes, he tries to possess him, and there's all manner of stories there, but they're more the stories of the Dark Master rather than necessarily the stories of Mortime. The story of Mortime is that it is done fucked. It's proper broken <laughs> at this point. It's, done, it's ruined. Done fucked. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. Um, and uh, the next steps for it are really just the uh, gathering of everyone from across the world to this area. So you can imagine the carnival, not carnival, big C, carnival of chaos, but inspect the carnival of chaos of all the people that are trying to get in there. The cutthroat nature of it, the amount of death and horror that's going on here, the rise of the chaos powers, the rise of an ever chosen, an ever chosen getting summoned to this city, that ever chosen being taken over by Bellacor, and the whole nature of these plots that are happening here. This is arguably at this point the most important city in the world because everything that could bring about the end of the world is happening here and as we all know it doesn't quite come to pass as good old Bellacor would like because the ever chosen that he possesses isn't so happy to be possessed as it turns out and ever chosens are not exactly without power um his plan to possess the ever chosen doesn't quite go according to plan the fact that he needs all of the warp stone because his essence spread across it makes it much more difficult for him to do everything that he wants to do his mm. plan doesn't quite work but nevertheless, the actual concept of his plan was sound. And that was that there is a process in place, put in place by the, the ruinous powers, that those evil chaos gods uh, to ruin the world, to bring it about. And they will empower someone if they go through that process. And um, he already has the power. What he's looking to do is to take basically all of that power again by becoming ever chosen and they can't stop it. It is pretty much a process because it's in the material world rather than off in the realms of the gods where they largely control things. It's here in the material realm. If, they, if he goes through that, he will become not just more powerful than the chaos gods, he'll be able to lord himself over them. And he's also material as well as being immaterial. He has a good plan. It's just obviously they don't want it to work. So we have yep. all of that. And it eventually arises with the complete fall of um, more time as a place to go and it becomes that cursed place that no one goes to because there's no longer handy weird stone hanging around that you can just pick it up because it's all been used for one purpose or another the uh rise of the chaos fell and it just becomes this cursed black hole that nobody approaches and for good reason as you find out when we do the go trek and novel side yes so um the, so I think the point that we should go to here is probably kind of what happens at the aftermath of that. Uh, in some ways, it could be argued that for a good while, a uh, couple hundred years, Bellicor gets functionally stuck. Um, like he gets stuck in the yeah. city. And as He's the trapped. weird as the weird stone dries up, so does newcomers. And the city kind of becomes more of an isolated hellscape that only the truly desperate uh, go to to basically run away from something else or because they have maybe heard rumors of Bellacor uh, or this dark master but because he doesn't really have anything to offer anyone as he gets stuck here even his own followers either start to just die or abandon him and flee to other powers and it's worth noting that there are some forces that actively um 
try to cordon off more time uh, mm-hmm. where you have the vampire wars rise up and that makes more time even more avoidable because it's so close to Sylvania uh, and Sylvania. I mean, the vampire wars are almost a nonstop just mess for yeah. a good while of like Vlad immediately followed by Conrad immediately almost followed by Manfred of uh, like Bellicor is just sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting and no one really of interest comes i'm sure there could be some fun stories about some witch hunters that are particularly brave or blessed priests or desperate chaos cultist or some idiot bretonian questing knight <laughs> and such that all go down in there and they all die horribly but uh basically nothing happens for a while until magnus good old magnus the destruction of mordheim again Yes, which is a really interesting thing of Magnus. One of the things that's really fascinating about Magnus, um, which I'm I'm so excited and also scared for the old world because he's so important to everything that's going to happen, and it's going to be really easy for them to fuck it up. But really uh, easy. Um, Magnus is a fairly well unexplored character, which is weird considering how critical he is to the modern era. Um, but Magnus, after everything that goes down at the Battle of the Gates of Kislev. He wins, Asbar Kul dies somehow, either whether Magnus killed him or somebody else, who cares? But uh, he wins. And, and as he kind of is doing his victory lap, one of the things that's explored in some other various video games or other novels and such is that obviously when a Chaos Horde is defeated, it's usually virtually always not because Chaos was fully defeated, but rather the central figurehead dies and, and the army right. collapses and just scatters. The yep, problem yep. with that is like if you turn on a light in a really gross kitchen, cockroaches run in every direction. Now they're just everywhere <laughs> instead of in one really bad spot. True so, fact. So chaos goes in every fucking direction. And as you may note, uh, Kislev is right above uh, the Empire and Ostermark is right there. Um, in fact, uh, as you can see in some of the old world maps, a fair bit of Ostermark, likely because of how it was weakened by the Mordheim Crisis and the Vampire Wars, a lot of Ostermark actually got eaten up by Kislev for a while. Um, and Kislev expanded its borders dramatically. But um, as these, a lot of these Chaos Horses fled south, and they went into the Empire and started causing a mess. And so Magnus, unfortunately, did not get to relax. He immediately had to turn around and start running through the... Yeah, he never gets relaxed. I'm pretty sure that man died busy. <laughs> but, uh, poor bastard. He's all That's all he wanted. But uh, um, uh, he's... Anyway, I'm going to... There's a joke I would like to make, but I'm going to continue on. But uh, Magnus kind of starts going on... You could kind of think of it as a victory lap, but I'm sure it was a lot more horrific than that because, unfortunately... These weren't just like little amounts of chaos. These were thousands and thousands of war bands of beastmen, warriors mm-hmm. of chaos, many of whom had genuine champions or sorcerers who were very powerful and were like, you know what? All right, as of our cool loss, but we can still loot. We can still <laughs> have a great time. And their Magnus and his troops are coming across villages or cities that have been burned and looted and raided, and thousands of people are dying. And Magnus is going, Jesus. All right. It's and awful. as he's kind of making this lap to kind of clean up as much of the Empire as he can, he eventually turns his attention to Mordheim. Because Mordheim has been this festering pit of awful. And I think Magnus is probably wise enough at this point, especially maybe with the advice of Teclis and everyone else he's got around him, to know that Mordheim is not just, like, not affecting things. Having such a notable pit of corruption is going to cause problems. And furthermore, it gives a gathering point for those forces of chaos because they can sense that corruption there too. And that's probably ultimately what drove him there was that I imagine a lot of the chaos forces, maybe because of Bellicor's own influence, started to gather to Mordheim, which could have turned almost into a fortress. Yeah, Mordheim is one of those areas that if you can imagine when it was created and it's current form 1999 to the year 2000 on new year's day it is struck by this enormous comet thud and it turns itself turns the entire area into a hellscape 
and it doesn't get better. If anything, it gets worse because in the center of this area, our dark rituals are being summoned. Dark magics are being used. All manner of awfulness is occurring within the walls and in the surrounding area around Dread Mordheim. It becomes the city of a dam for a reason. And once it had been, once the gold rush, so to speak, of all of this uh, weird stone passes by, it's just this pit of awfulness that's sitting down there like a festering boil. Now, would they like to have resolved this earlier? Yes, I can imagine when we go back to the halls of Altdorf or Nuln or Marienburg or anywhere else, they've got this loose idea of, yes, one day we shall cleanse the place. The Cult of Sigmar sitting there going, oh, it has to be <laughs> properly sanctified and brought back underneath our control and so on and so forth. It was an imperial capital after all. And as we all know, the Cult of Sigmar is obsessed with Sigmar's empire and the borders that Sigmar maintained, built and drove out towards and this was one of the capitals of the true tribes of Sigmar there is absolutely no way they would be happy for that to be properly lost if it can be reclaimed they'd want to do it but it was the dark ages the start of um, that was caused by largely Empress Magritte beforehand but that's thudding comet coming into more time in many respects started the dark ages the vampire wars have been going on for centuries grom the paunch had flood through not mm -hmm. the only orc war to do so um it was 300 years of sheer hell for the empire and they were also warring with each other throughout the entirety of that time and it's at the end of that time that the old world game the new one that's coming is about to kick off and they almost certainly will not portray such a hellscape for the empire because they want to portray the empire as the good guys because they often <laughs> do which means that they will probably set up with a few factions all of whom are quite good with big mustaches and a slightly different version of who they are um but the complexity of the politics will be siphoned down something simpler to make it easier to deal with yeah but when I, when I... 300 years <laughs> of this horrible city there one of the, really? one of the very really? first things that magnus <laughs> in a position of power in a position where the entirety of the empire is turning to him and saying yes you can lead us the people will accept no other emperor the people have moved and all the nobles who want to have their independence are being dragged to his heel and the very first, one of his very first jobs is to finally cleanse more time. To finally, finally sort it out. But as is often the case for such an area of horrendous magics, that's a little bit easier said than done. Yeah. And uh, like Andy was saying, one of the things that's interesting to think about is <laughs> it. I would not have been shocked if there was probably attempts by the Sigmarites, especially with like the Reichland emperors to be like, let's send an army to Mordheim and cleanse it. And they tried <laughs> only to get ambushed by the Talabekland emperor and yeah. a, a war breaks out because <laughs> they're like, no, that's in our territory. Fuck you guys. We're not letting you do what you want. Um, but, um, but yes, yeah. Magnus does eventually show up and what he does successfully do is Magnus raises Mordheim to the ground. Yeah, um, he just he flattens the whole them. fucking city, um, and it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's not. It's it's like yeah. <laughs> unfortunately he could not just carpet bomb it from existence uh i mean he, he did the warhammer equivalent of carpet bombing it from existence yeah. he really tried um and all sorts of magics were thrust into that place but sadly there was one thing sitting at the center of it which made it effectively impossible to properly destroy in the same way that one of our alternative um topics for this week to discuss drakenfels is not so easy to stop and the Bellacor, the Dark Master, not so easy to stop. Indeed, the amount of magics that had gone on there had already fractured reality to agree within more time, and the destruction of it fractures it completely, and time itself, shyish, begins to shatter, causing all manner of shyish issues in the area, and it's in those fragments of time, almost like alternate histories, as in, hey, the computer game can sit alongside, um, the novels can sit alongside, the standard more time game can sit alongside everything else, fragments into different, almost pocket realms of existence, where Bellacor continues. Yeah, so, uh, despite their best efforts, and just, just to put it clear of how bad the situation was in Mordheim, this is likely not only like Magnus the Pious with the full blessings of Sigmar, and he's got the full backing now of all the Elector Counts, of all the provinces, of all the cults, and he's got Volans and Teclas with him. They still can't do it yeah. because it's that bad. 
they've done their best shot. Yeah. Now, granted, yeah. from from all accounts, it is a lot better than it was. You know, mm -hmm. it is. They do get rid of you know pretty much all the buildings. They do level it as best they can so that armies can't gather there and monsters can't hide there easily. But no one is able to basically dislodge Bellacor, who they can't really see. Like at this point, yeah. he's just shadowy essence ness. Um, yeah. but uh, which uh, which f the one of the actually really interesting things is we. <laughs> 88, 88. I love it. <laughs> oh god, the stream's cursed now. This. You're brilliant. <laughs> uh Manages, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Much beloved and anticipated I'm planning using modified war cry chaos legionnaires as to lay in chaos warriors for the old world. Oh, that's fun. What unique ways may chaos manifest in Talea as compared to the Empire or Cathay? Uh so I will start. Of that, first of all, that's a fucking brilliant idea. Uh, Warcry minis for anyone out there that is ever wanting to use kit bashing or like Warhammer Fantasy stuff, Warcry is perfect. Yeah, Warcry, um, like literally minis. any of the warbands you could use in Warhammer Fantasy super easily. Um, second of all, um, Talea, the big things about them that are very unique as far as like how chaos would manifest is that A, uh, Talea has a very strong focus on mercenaries as just like a lifestyle which means that you have a lot of people using very unconventional and unique forms of warfare to try. And a lot of people, a lot of the Talayan mercenaries try to style themselves because it makes you more advertiserable, essentially. Uh, so specializing in a unique form of warfare or a unique form of armor or a unique form of weapons. Um, the other thing is that Talaya has some very unique gods who, if those followers were to fall to chaos, could have some very unique effects, such as Sulcanites. Um, Solcon is, uh, is a, he's a solar God. Uh, he's a God of the sun, but he's also a God of order, but like the scary kind of order that is ruthless and has no sense of mercy. And it's like, if you think a Sigmarite witch hunter is bad, no, 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 no. Solcon is so much worse. And so if you had a band of Solcanites who fell to chaos, they would be immensely cruel individuals who would probably specialize very heavily in forms of, if I was making them, um, Sulcanites are very infamous for torture as a way to get confessions and a way to get people to admit to things that they maybe wouldn't otherwise. Um, and I would probably imagine a group of Sulcanites who fell to chaos being people that see all of the world as tainted and they're the only good guys, even though they fall into chaos, and they exult in punishing the rest of the world for not being pure. And so they use like a lot of weapons and arms that uh, don't result in direct death, but instead cripple or cause pain without causing immediate death. Uh, if you're wanting like a particular style, which I think the Legionnaires would slot well into that, uh, but also like lean really heavily on Roman influences, Italian influences, because that's what Talia is all about. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Andy's got any further ideas to add. Yeah, I'll do a few more general points. Um, loosely speaking, um, the obvious source for anything that you're going to draw upon will be Italy and the various city-states of Italy and the how they would reflect into the city-states of Tilia. Um, remember a few key things about um, your Tilians. Um, they don't have a strong colleges of magic, so if you're going to build something new and exciting, consider what they might have instead. Um, that's always a fun aspect. Consider the Roman influence and the classical influence, but also to a degree the Greek influence from across the mountains and how that would influence uh, the overall setting. But I would generally say religion should be at the core of whatever you build because religion is very much at the core of many of the stereotypes that come out of Italy. So it's worth plumbing into those. The ideas of the gladiators, um, which are very much a part and parcel of Tilian lifestyle. They have their big gladiatorial rings, mm -hmm. um, which um, in turn came from originally the ogres and their fighting pits. Um, that was an import. Um, so having ogres in there as well is worthwhile. So if you're building your own uh, war bands or similar, make sure that you've got ogres and included in that because they're part of the Tilian society. It's a well-established part of um, what they work with. So religion, gunpowder, get that in there because that's always fun. So get some equivalent of that in there. Um, your Roman uh, aspects, get some of that in there too. Plus those warring city-states and the greed that lies behind much of that. And the fact that merchants have risen to the point that they have often out 
classed or moved above the actual nobility that's in the area. So having some sort of mercantile aspect to it is definitely worth doing. And then you can then look at why each one of these pillars is going to be potentially corrupted and changed by chaos and what it then becomes. Thank you very thank much you. for that. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks. You rock. So uh, Man, this is actually... Caleb. Uh, this is actually a question I have for Andy because I'm not sure about the answer for this, which is Ooh. I have never found easily a source that talks about what exactly happened to Mordheim and kind of the aftermaths of the setting, but before Magnus gets there. As far as okay, like, so where did the Sisters of Sigmar go? How did the root yeah, thing so go? I picked up the Sisters of Sigmar and dropped in um, a part of them as the Sisters of Faith and Charity over into uh, the Tome of Salvation, um, mm. where they go. so they were like a sister order that came later. But there, there's a reason it's never been picked up. It's because no one's really ever picked it up. More time uh, exists in this strange limbo, and let me explain this. More time is not Warhammer. Now that might sound <laughs> inherently stupid because it is. But Mordheim is a separate license to Warhammer. So that means if you want to develop Mordheim, you have to get a license for that as a licensee to go do it. And we're not talking about Games Workshop Studio, someone that's trying to make it into a computer game or a board game or a role-playing game. So all of the Mordheim material for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is a separate license to the Warhammer license, which means Mordheim only gets referenced. It doesn't get used or developed inside the role-play game hmm, very much. Interesting. Okay, so more time doesn't get the same level of development in terms of its overall impact as, say, for example, the Warhammer world as a whole, because it is a separate license. Now, can you reference it? Yes, but could I set a campaign there if I was writing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay? No, I could not. I would need to buy the actual license for more time. So there's a reason that there is a dearth of material mm. because the licensees have not been in a position where they can develop it unless they do more time. And if you're doing a more time license, you're going to be doing it in 1999 when the comment hex. That's fucking awesome because that's a really cool bit. So mm. you don't need to worry about what comes next. Now, could someone pick it up and do that? Yes, there could be a Black Library novel. There could be all that. But Warhammer died. And, and at its peak point of development, where we're looking at, say, 2010 area, when all the stories of more time, 10 years worth of development have been put in place, and everyone's going, what happens next? They're like, well, that's a good idea. Let's sit down, figure it all out. Oh, holy shit, no, we're going to end the Warhammer world. So now the stories they tell aren't about what came next after more time. They're the stories of how does this influence the end times? So thus we get ourselves a book, a novel, which explains how the shattered remnants of more time and Bellacor that's trapped within it um, and how that uh, entire city being trapped back in the time when Magnus had destroyed it back in 2303-4, whatever it was, um, back then. And Gortrek and Felix arrive in, as they are wont to do. They kick ass, they chew gum. They attempt to stop um, Bellacor's big ritual to reaffirm himself back into reality. But in doing so, Belcor gets free and can do whatever the fuck he wants because it, time itself is broken around him and goes back in time and is in fact free at the same time as being constrained. There's a really nice, that whole book, the whole thing it sets up is really fun, but it's more Belcor's story than it is more times because more time by this point is just a shattered remnant. It's not really the big city of the dam that it once was, but it does make for a really good setting for the novel. Do recommend going have a little look yes, at that. Good, great job there by David Geimer. Yeah. He did a really good job with Go. Really good job there. Um, but loosely speaking, there's not really a great amount of information post the, indeed, even leading up to Magnus and the post Magnus, um, because that entire section of the story is almost in a gray area in terms of where it's going to be developed, because at the key point when it almost certainly would have been developed, there was no one there to develop it because the game itself was ending. So I'm really interested to see what happens when the old world comes out because the old world is going to have this as one of the key Magnus stories. Now, we're going to have to build up to the Great War Against Chaos, and that might be the entirety of the old world. But if the old world is a success, it's going to have spun-off stories. And one of the big questions is going to be, what the hell did Magnus do to Mordheim? What actually happened there? How did it mm. occur? And how did Mordheim become the shattered remnant that will then become the primary point of the story that is later, later told by David Geimer? So, yeah, you're, you're spot on. There's not a lot written about it at all, other than like a snippet here. I mean, when I was writing the um, sections for the timeline for the Empire, I almost drilled in deep to Mordheim. I had a quick chat with Games Workshop about it, actually. And the reply was, yeah, Mordheim's a separate license. Don't worry about it. 
And I was like, well, <laughs> but all right, I want to learn about it. <laughs> I mean, I want to. I really like to at least just add a sentence or four. And they were like, yeah, don't worry about it unless it's particularly pertaining to the story you're telling. Just, just mention that more time exists, and don't worry about it from that point onwards. And I was like, fair enough, I won't, and I didn't concentrate there. Having said that, though, and I think I said this in a previous uh, stream, I was going to be setting a story in more time. One of the campaign ideas that um, we had before I landed on the one that I did with Gav um, was going to be a three timeline, a, a, a story told at three points: one um, at the end times, one when the comet lands, and one right in between when um, the Dark Master has completely failed and is trapped. And is lost in there with no body, with the bones of the ever chosen in place. And each one of the events are fractured in time because of what's happened there. And they're influencing each other. So you're playing the same story across three separate timelines. It would be a fun campaign. Um, well, and yeah, it would have. <laughs> uh, and it would have plumbed into a lot of what happened in Tomorrow Time. And when I was sitting down in Games Workshop, I was like, um, can I do this? They're like, yeah, of course you can if you get yourself a more Time license. And I was like, right, good to know. I won't <laughs> yeah, be doing sure, that. For money. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, so <laughs> I only had the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay license at that point, obviously. So if you're out there and want to do a fun homebrew campaign, one of the really fun questions to ask is what happens to Bellacor in the aftermath of the Mordheim crisis of, okay, he's possessed Cardin's body, but who kills him? Does he just starve to death or did some hero manage to fight their way to him and bring him down? Um, it's sort of, that's sort of loosely told through the course of the campaigns from Mordheim afterwards where the ever chosen himself pretty much kicked him out um, mm. and died. Um, so it's sort of already half told, but you could certainly retell that any way you want, because one of the joys of the Mordheim game was that it gave you this setting, this entire all end of the world setting. The end is nigh. Everyone's carrying their banners. Everyone's pestilent. Everyone's decayed. Just look at that black and white, stark, horrific, Bosch-esque art sitting all the way through. It's terrible times. And it is quite literally the setting that they say the end of the world can come. They give you the opportunity to tell your own tales. And the tale that they told in the studio is just one version of what could be told. And to a degree, they interlace that with how more time eventually ends, where time itself has its own little fractured pocket. So yeah, go wild with it. Tell your own mm. stories. It's super, super fun. Um, and the very nature of Bellacor means you can tell almost anything and it's not too silly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> So to wrap up the Magnus plot of that Magnus, he successfully destroys the city um, and pretty much anything that wasn't Bellicor in it. Uh, it's raised all of the monsters and chased out the beastmen are chased out or killed. And it's just kind of a ruin. And they look at it and go, well, that's as good as it's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> and they go home. Uh, and they, I mean, unfortunately they were right. That was as good as it was going to get until very, very late in the timeline to almost 200 years later when Gotrek and Felix show up and being Gotrek and Felix, they do their wonderful thing of doing a good thing. That kind of is a bad thing <laughs> by smacking pigs with an ax. <laughs> um, but uh, as far as uh, one of the questions that I actually have for Andy about uh, Mordheim uh, involving the sisters of Sigmar is that yes. one of the things I found very interesting through multiple editions, multiple games even uh because the warhammer online age of reckoning game actually touched on this in its novels that it released was the idea that um in some editions there's a really strong idea put forward that sigmar uh the the cult of sigmar is very patriarchal and yeah. that they do not allow women warrior priests they don't allow mm. women to be anything but like functionally nuns like servants um, and they, their reasoning, the reasoning that's provided in those books is that after the Mordheim crisis and the meteor struck the city, the Grand Theodos went, ah, see, this is a sign from Sigmar that women are bad and women shouldn't be allowed to be part of the cult. This is what happens when we allow women to uh, be a part of what Sigmar is doing. He clearly doesn't want this. And they get like banned for hundreds of years until oh. those books provide something happens but i have seen that in other editions it doesn't say that and it's like yeah, yeah no it's totally fine women can absolutely right. so, be blessed priests there's um a fairly long convoluted uh discussion to be had here that i'm going to summarize with a discussion that we had during the second edition of warmer fantasy role play um and I was in charge of writing all the Sigmar sections in the Tome of Salvation um, in that. Um, and I included a female order in that um, on purpose because there was an ongoing prevalent belief 
that the cult of Sigmar couldn't have any women involved in it at all. And the prevalent belief at that point was much, much more sexist than the one that was being suggested there by Sotek, um, which was there was no sisters and more time was wrong. Um, which was a fascinating argument to take, I thought, <laughs> um, given that Ma Mordheim by that point was some five years old and was an established part of the setting. Um, but they were like, no, no, Sigmar is most definitely a patriarchal cult. Um, I contradicted this heavily and for not necessarily the reasons that many people would have immediately thought. My first one was, it's not the freaking Catholic Church, which is what many people had tried to portray it as. And indeed, many of the arguments that were happening publicly amongst the fan base were, it can't have female members because the Catholic priests don't have female members, so thus we shouldn't. And it's like, what, what, what? It's the cult of Sigmar. It's not like, what? That made no sense to me. And indeed, in many respects, Warhammer should be distancing itself from trying to look like that the cult of Sigmar is just the Catholic Church, but in a different way. Sure, they're drawing inspirations for a certain part, but inspirations only. Um, that offended me um, to, to my core. So I very much went, no, look, it's not the Catholic Church. And this is one way of showing how, particularly because the Warhammer world, bizarrely and somewhat unexpectedly, is much less sexist in many ways than the real world is, or indeed has been, because of the very nature of its gods being real, because of the very nature of how society it uses. It's got so many different versions of um, societal and cultural uh let's say leanings in different directions that some parts yes are super sexist but some parts are super sexist in a very different way and often in the opposite way each of the different tribes have got their own traditions in the cult of sigmar not the cult of sigmar pardon me in the empire and each mm. of those tribes some of them were female led right from the very beginning um so there's just a different sh framework and i had a big long chat behind the scenes saying it should be definitely open to both genders and this is why um and then we had a big discussion about what genders was and i said to all genders because that is the nature of those discussions <laughs> at that point um and i mean it should be open and this is why and everybody after a long discussion agreed particularly because the sisters of sigmar that were sitting down in more time existed but we also had other examples adrian smith at that point had done a really good um image of a sister of sigmar who had nothing to do with the more time version um who was just a warrior priestess of sigmar and they popped up in the card game as well warrior priests that were female the war game popped up and there was what female everything in that there was equal chance mm -hmm. because it, they were they were offering that up to the world and if you want to play a female character enough power for you um um, so that was all interlaced within it. And we wrote it as a cult that had patriarchal elements. But if you wanted to see a proper patriarchal cult, look at the cult of Ulrich. They were not that. They were different. And it was also another way to show how the cult of Ulrich and the cult of Sigmar were different. The cult of Ulrich, which is in many respects much more progressive, in this area was much less progressive and somewhat recidivist in terms of its tone. So loosely... Um, in the Warhammer world as it currently stands, um, there are female and otherwise priest clerics, shall we say, of Sigmar across the board almost from the beginning. Um, and that's just the way it is. There is no limitations um, depending upon your sex or gender, however you wish to express these things. They just don't exist. But there are a significant number of men within that cult. But there's entire orders of nuns of uh, warrior priestesses and similar and there have been for a very long time and more times uh, component and addition to that is considered to be one of the most important ones of that era it was politically extraordinary because it drew people from across the known uh, empire as a whole the big uh, pardon me, it didn't just draw people, it drew nobles from across the empire as a whole. So it had nobles from every corner of the empire with their daughters there. It was considered to be a great thing to go there. Plus, it was also where the, one of the primary seers of Sigmar was sighted as it became Cassandora later. Um, and she was gifted with insight of the future by Sigmar and protected from that comet coming down by Sigmar. Anyone that was actually blessed by Sigmar would realize that the sight that they had was blessed. It was definitely on Sigmar's side. So whilst there was a strong element, particularly from the Grand Theogenist of the time, who pitched himself against the 
what was effectively a, almost an Electra count of Sigmar building on the other side. Mm. That the the Grand Theogenist of that era was trying to create a theocracy. He wanted to be emperor. To make that clear, the Mortime story is the Grand Theogenist of that era wanted to be emperor. He wanted to yeah. ditch the whole concept of Sigmar's heirs and just say, no, the cult of Sigmar leads, which would have turned it into a theocracy. That was his plan. And the Sisters of Sigmar were against that. Now, where the Sisters of Sigmar come the modern day, who can say? Because Mordheim is a separate license. Yeah. Well, so they never really got the detail. So what I what I want to say is that for anyone that hasn't, if you want to just see a really fascinating author that was trying to rectify those two different views by games workshop uh empire and ruins by anthony reynolds um is the book where he really tackles it of because one of the characters in it is a woman who becomes a warrior priest because the game warhammer online age of reckoning they really wanted to have female warrior yeah. priests but the the lord the lord at that time was running with kind of the idea of oh it's supposed to be male only so he does a really good job of exploring it and bringing up more time specifically of of exploring that it's not that there aren't blessed women of Sigmar, it's that there are figures within the cult who view that as a political rivalry yes. and don't want it. And it's fascinating as her powers awaken and she becomes a full-on warrior priest. He does a great job exploring that. Highly recommended for anyone that wants to find it. Um, probably a hard book to find these days. Yeah, but, not too uh, easy to find. Um, I've got it over there. Um, yeah. uh, as but, well uh, as the, the the cool orc model that you got yeah. with the special edition of that uh, game. Grumbag and uh, Grumlock yeah. and Gazbag. Just awesome. up there. Awesome. Just now. He's, he's awesome. Um, I was going to say something else. I completely forgot. I was going to say. Oh yes, um, and um, Anthony Reynolds, in fact, will be popping on inside the Rookery um, in the next oh, so many weeks. Oh, we don't have the exact date pinned down oh, now. He doesn't that? do that many interviews because he currently works for Riot Games, I think, um, and he asks permission for each of his interviews. But um, fortunately, he has de decided to uh, join us. So do make sure you go and subscribe over wow. to the uh, Rookery Publications page over on YouTube if you'd like to watch that when we pop up the advert for when that goes live, um, because that's going to be a lot fun Th thank you hammond <laughs> so fun he's not still the heretic yeah there you go that, there's there's your call sign if you're gonna be <laughs> sulcanite or, or um, alternatively if you're yelling at the sulcanites <laughs> yeah on, on sulcan just as a small thing sulcan has a really fun cult in general um and if you're looking for the empire equivalent as i've said in a previous stream you've got the cult of sul s o umlaut l l um the river sul can be found in Visenland, um and their cult cult the cult of sul is effectively the cult of sulcan it's just the empire equivalent of it and the sulcan um cult is largely a tillian thing nowadays all right, uh, Andy, unless you've got anything else you want to hit on with Mordheim, would you like to start, or uh, are you going to start answering questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, uh, I'll just say that um, Mordheim, just as a nice summary, is often perceived as just a game, and it is looked at as just that. But for those of us who are interested in the lore that it has brought to the game, it is much more, because it brings some incredibly important events into the light that had previously not been the case. Number one, it confirms that in 1999, and probably for the next five to ten years after that, it is incursion of chaos time. It's not just a, a bad city that's surrounded by bad stuff. It's proper. Gates are waxing. End of the world times have arrived, and the ever-chosen is happening now going through all the steps to become ever chosen and Belakor is attempting to make take control of that it is an enormous story not for more time but the warhammer world as a whole if you're looking for what's happening in the rest of the world this is when the chaos hordes are now attacking they're mm. doing things elsewhere and that is something that we should try to keep in mind it grounds it into the entire timeline of the warhammer world as a, not just a key event but a key city because belacor drags everything around the world to him and attempts to end the world according to its own designs and its own desires there then and fails. I don't see this as a great failure. Oh my God, Bellacor again. Um, 
it's it's an almost impossible feat. He's looking to end the freaking world to become a chaos god, and he gets close. I mean, that's pretty impressive in and of its freaking self. Mordheim is that tale. It's the tale of Belakor, and I think Belakor obviously will make quite an interesting other stream. Um, but if you're yes. looking for a single city that represents um, some of the greatest tales that Warhammer often tells, it's this one. Mordheim is the centre of what becomes the big Warhammer story, i.e. chaos is looking to end the world. And this was one chaos god's attempt to do that, in this particular case, Belakor. And I know I'm using the word chaos god arguably a bit loosely here, but given that he was created to be a, a, an effective replacement of Malal, it's not so loose. Yeah, well, quite I, I, it, it's god. such a core component of literally all of his big schemes is becoming yeah. becoming a full god. And yeah, kind yeah, of with yeah. the implication cool. that if he does, he would whoop the shit out of the other four, which is terrifying. Um, but uh yep, yeah, agree with all that. Also, uh like fascinatingly, from an in-universe perspective and a our actual world perspective, if you're ever wanting to look at the evolution of Warhammer Fantasy and how it changed mm. over the course of editions, yeah. and also just what happened within the universe itself. More time really kind of is the most important city there is in the setting. Which yeah, is it's a fulcrum point um, for the entire Warhammer game, because before, before more time, um, Warhammer had been moving in a more cartoony direction as fourth edition, um, which was still trying to find itself and basically recreated Warhammer into a box set, turned to fifth edition, which became a little bit more cartoony. I can remember the White Dwarfs at the time with all the little cartoons of the Tony and Knights chasing little cartoony um, nurglings or little cartoony <laughs> Skaven and moved into a far more kid-friendly front. And then Mordheim came slapping in this dark, gothic, awesome game um, where the end of the world was nigh. It was bleak as fuck. All the artwork was stark black and white. All of the uh, all of the creatures were broken, twisted, boils and warts because it's the end of the world. It's truly different. And then Warhammer after that, in turn, was different. The art styles changed entirely. Black and white pieces were all over the place, but in a slightly all well, with a consistent darker Six, tone. Sixth edition was a very sixth consistent, edition, probably the most consistent artistically, and it's dark yeah, yeah, yeah. Plug. Sixth and, edition and sixth edition dark. nailed a tone that would run right through to eighth edition of Warhammer. Eighth edition started uh, becoming more. Let's be honest, it started becoming more Age of Sigmar um, mm. in that they started adding lots of bigger elements, large focus piece miniatures um, that, um, instead of lots of troops. Yeah, it was um, the addition of monsters. It was the addition of monsters and cool big shit. Um, and that, in many respects, made it a touch more cartoony because of that. It was bigger and, you know, more over the top. But it was still grounded heavily in the ethos that Mordheim had put into place. Mordheim is more than just a city. Mordheim is what Warhammer was going to become. And it influenced it deeply. And we are, I think, in many respects, um, we have that because of Thomas Prennan's, um, Thomas Prennan's uh, entire direction for that. and. I think the art direction on it um, is actually extraordinary. The art direction deserves to be popped out um, for called out for just how awesome oh, yeah. it is. John Blanche, John Blanche deserves a freaking medal for that game alone. Uh, I'll, I will always say, 6th edition is when the Lizardmen went from I did not like them to I fucking love them. That is when modern <laughs> Lizardmen came out. Um, oh, teeny wee. Uh, yeah, laughing god. Uh, the real questions are asking Mordheim were there fish people? You joke, you joke, but there fucking were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are absolutely fish. The answer is Mordheim. yes. Um, the answer is yes. Um, yeah. there's an entire cult based around people who wore large fish masks as well. Um, Mordheim is the center of much more than you realize. Yeah, Mordheim uh is <laughs> also like on a big river, and there's a whole thing about the things in the river, the things in the lake. Uh, there's a whole spiel about that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, fucking love fishmen. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> questions. All right, so Question. um uh let's see here we go uh okay so here it is here's the first one um i have one question that was posted over on my side which i'm going to um field very quickly oh, yeah, yeah, go super ahead. Simple. and that was what was more time like before which i think is a, an interesting one that and is also an question. how the hell did more time get access to any trade given the enormous waterfalls that stand between it and the river reich so I think there are two fascinating questions. Um, the first one is sadly, I think, ultimately going to be a bit boring because Mordheim as a setting was created 
to spec in 1999 um and it didn't mm. need to have a previous history so what was it before it's pretty much what every warhammer city was before an evolving building developing capital in this case um almost certainly the center of uh the tribe that used to make their existence there the, the but there were three main cities and they go across the entire area. So loosely, it's just another imperial city that reached the point of being large and decadent. Yeah, I, I would say based on kind of what we were talking about earlier, if you were wanting to kind of theorize about it, because there's literally nothing on it. But if you mm. wanted to theorize about it, I think a real strength would be trying to explore a its focus as a breadbasket and being in a very unique position where it because it was close to Sylvania it might have benefited very strongly from the presence of Van Hal during the, the Black Plague Wars. And so, so it was spared a lot of the Skaven issues that a lot of the crushed a lot mm -hmm. of the Empire for so many centuries. Yeah, I'd also add that it's right next door to Sylvania. In fact, it's not just next door to Sylvania, it pretty much is in Sylvania mm -hmm. almost. Um, and that, I think, speaks to Sylvanian history. Now, the Sylvanian history, depending on which version you use, they had their own tribe of humans in the area, the Fenonis. Um, And that's one of those little known facts that kick around in the background. It originally came from oh, a fancy role play one fan base, I think, originally, um, the Fenonis. And they're, it's mentioned in a couple of the hills, the, Fe the Fenon Hills are down there as well. Um, and that's a separate tribe of humanity that's in the area. And they would have almost certainly been subsumed by both the Burgundians that are coming over from one side, them coming in from the uh, north as well. Um, and uh, that suggests that Sylvania was a contested area throughout. I supported that in one of the maps for Sylvania, saying that parts of it were contested. Sylvania has been its own province for some time. So you'll probably find that Ostermark warred with frequently warred with Stirland um, over this particular area, which means that uh, Mortime may not originally have been on the southern border. It may have been, uh, most of uh, mm. Sylvania may be part of Ostermark. Yeah. Is that covered anywhere? No, not really, but it is naturally going to be the case if the capital is there. The capital is going to extend a reach of at least 20 to 30 miles down into what is the Verhungen, the Hunger Wood and all the rest of it. Pretty freaking awful there, but it wouldn't always have been like that. The maps that we have for today is not the maps that they would have had a thousand years ago. So do consider if you're looking for developing what it builds up towards being later, that this is a center of imperial politics. Now, it might be a periphery one on the edge, but it's still a center. And that means that Sylvania almost certainly is considered theirs up until the city is destroyed. They probably considered Sylvania to be theirs. And good old Karstens to the south may have been allies, may have been strong mm. allies, may even have considered themselves um, to be a part of Ostermark rather than a part of Stirland, as we generally consider Sylvania. So try to think of the politics that lead up to it and don't just do that by looking at the city look at the things around it yeah i'd also say keep in mind vlad is right there and vlad was a political genius in a lot of ways when it came to I imperial thought. uh when it came to imperial politics he would have been very invested in mordheim being like a strong economic center because his goal wasn't to destroy the empire it was to take over the it's empire really he wanted it to survive um, yeah. Um. I, one thing to remember about Vlad is that his downfall was almost certainly Isabella. Um. Uh. And arguably her desires and her wants and her needs. I remember discussing with Steve Savile. Um. He was the author of the vampire books in there. And I, I, I took issue with many of the choices that I made. But regardless, I still took a lot of a lot of our discussions about it were fun. Um. And he always thought of um. Uh. <laughs> Vlad as almost the genius uh, Heathcliff of the whole piece and he's very romantic figure um, <laughs> sitting up there doing his things <laughs> Vlad is just awesome um, and I sort of half agree Vlad is a figure who almost certainly is a figure of stability, not anarchy. And the Vampire Wars that came could arguably lead um, Isabella and her desperate desire for more control and expansion, which arguably could have come from the Gash because she was much more weak-willed because she was younger mm. than um, Vashanesh. I mean, Vlad. Um, because <laughs> Vlad is ancient and extremely strong-willed, so the best way to influence him is with someone else, not by trying to directly control him. Yeah, uh, there's an unexplored story we'll have to tell. Hey, well, eventually, we will, eventually, we'll hit on Vlad. Uh, Sam, I'm really curious. Vlad about Vlad has a whole army of demons and greater demons he apparently has. Yes. I've never heard of this before. So I will say, there's a reason for the Total War community. I have been banging my drum of war so loudly that Bellicor should be a Demons of Chaos faction, not a Warriors of Chaos faction. Agreed. Because Bellicor has legions of demons. Like, he um, is the yeah. greatest demon general there is. Period. Period. Um, 
trapped there since the beginning of time, pretty much from when the cataclysm came, because he is a, almost a god. Um, and it's it's really easy to forget that because of some of the later stories that were written for him. But the original parts in the War Scroll that was written for him and all the rest, it makes it quite clear that at the beginning he had this giant thing and he is attempting to tap into it. During the Storm of Chaos, they had a slightly different version of Bellacor, um, where Bellacor was completely freed from the influence of Chaos. And in the Storm of Chaos version, mm -hmm. all the demons come all with demons. him because he is, yeah, because they're his demons. Um, and they're demons to him. They're not demons to corn. They're not demons. He is a god of undivided chaos. So they are demons that are very much Bellacor's demons. Um, and if you want to know what they might look like, there was a whole bunch of concept art made ages ago. And I do mean a long time ago by <laughs> Tony Ackland, who did all of the original versions of the demons that we know today, um, because he did the concept arts for the Realms of Chaos books back in like 1990 or 89 or 87 or whatever it was. I forget the name, the year. Um, but he also did um, the demons of Malal for that. And some people have even made models for what they might look at um, and, you know, scrapped off the screech <laughs> off the, uh, the barcodes there and, yeah. you know, Chop off there and say, definitely not Malal, but this yeah. random thing is pretty much a greater demon of Malal. And that's the sort of craziness you'd have seen. Now, obviously, if Games Workshop would run with that, it would change over time. Take a look at the original greater demons and lesser demon models that were made for the uh, say the third edition of Warhammer. Compare that with the ones that we have today. They're they're reminiscent, but they're most certainly developed. And that would have occurred as well. But Bellicor. There's a reason why he's one of the biggest fucking models in Age of Sigmar. It's because he'd have a whole bunch of greater demons under him. Yeah, and this is actually reinforced and explored in Age of Sigmar. Where granted, they Bellicor is so fucking powerful, he steals demons from the other gods. Like in the story, there's a full exploration during the Broken Realm storyline where there is a bloodthirster and a keeper of secrets who are branded with the mark of Bellicor because they belong to him. He figures out their true names and is like, nope, you're mine. Like, he leads legions of demons. There's also a whole thing where Bellicor really fucking looks down on mortals and considers them ants to him. He's much more interested in dealing with demons. Uh, but he's like, I mean, you have to remember, he's the first mortal entity that ascended to demonhood. He knows more secrets about demons than anybody that will ever live, ever. And arguably, um, before we move to Kabanda, and why? Um, <laughs> <laughs> before we move to that, arguably, he predates the Chaos Gods and their creation. Um, and I do say that arguably, because depending upon which version of the lore and exactly how you deem the Chaos Gods to exist, there are different ways that that could be put into place. But Kabanda's there, I think, is um, an interesting question. And I would argue, before we move into uh, it's worth to read now, why are there only, or why are there only Nurglish carnivals of Chaos? Why wouldn't the Pitiful Slaneshi or even Zinchins have similar groups? Um, the answer is probably yeah, maybe, but the problem with Slaanesh as a whole is that they tend to get a little bit fixated on what they're doing on the day. They wouldn't move on. Uh, there's corruption going on. They go, they go to excess, and that's one of the issues with Slaanesh. They work far better in a fixed location, taking people far beyond worded. They don't move on. Where Zinch, I would argue, does, but gets obsessed with the detail. Um, and mm. the initial failings of the gods themselves make it harder for them to do anything other than a one-off here or there. The whole concept of the Carnival of Chaos fits Nurgle surprisingly well. Yeah, and more, and more likely, if you were dealing with a non-Nurgle Carnival, it would probably be an undivided Carnival, which may have individuals from the different uh pantheons like you might have like yeah. a slaneshi who travels with them and is obsessed with a very particular thing but they sort of drag them around um and they're obsessed with like putting on performances or whatever or there's a zinchian sorcerer who hangs out with them and is using them for his own schemes or they've got cornate you know some kind of cornate strongman who's all about trying to lure people to the carnival that he then fights and tries to kill, or he fights whatever exotic creatures are in whatever place they're going to, but they would be more like individuals, not entire groups. Yep. Totally. And Roderick, thank you very much. Quickly, Poppy, and say yes, hi. Seems to, it seems totally up my stir and my stir also. Can we <laughs> catch it all afterwards? Um, on that, we didn't answer the question regarding the stir and how could they do trade up it. Now, for those oh, of yeah. you that don't know, the confluence of the River Reich and the stir 
um, is a giant cliff where a waterfall once stood. There is no easy way to go up there. In modern Warhammer, so we're talking 25, I say modern, we need a better term for 25, like 12 to 25, 20. Um, the end R times. Rain of France. I mean, it's the end France. times. Come the end times, okay? The last end times, whatever the hell you want to say. But the end times um, just means any time there's never yeah, been Yeah, no, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Too many terms. We'll come up with a term later. But come 25, 10-ish, um, that part of the River Stir has been filled with locks, um, meaning that you can get down what used to be a giant waterfall. And if we go back up river a further, like 50, 100 miles, or whatever it is, there's a further giant waterfall, which is cut off by another set of locks so you can make your way down. That was not the case in Mordheim's era, which means that Mordheim almost certainly didn't have river traffic coming from the right. Now, it had river traffic going along the stir, but the stir, as you'll know for anyone who knows the maps, does not have many cities sitting on the confluence of the stir and the right, and definitely none leading upstream, largely because there was no way to easily get to those areas back then. So they never mm. had that city founded and then built over the centuries. Um, indeed, that area is kind of almost a wilderness of trees and then the barn hills. Um, however, there are going to be trade with, say, Waldenhof. Waldenhof was long the capital and later becomes again the capital of Sylvania. Mm -hmm. And then trade up into the Middle Mountains. You've got to realize that the empire is actually, pardon my French, fucking huge. Um, <laughs> and just because you can't access that trade route doesn't mean that you're not on other waterway trade routes that lead into the south of Talibic land, the north over into Wurtbad, um, leading over up into the mountains. So the Wurtbad connection is by itself enormously influential. Yeah, a lot of just dwarves there too. Yeah, yeah, loads of dwarves up in the mountains that you're going to be trading down through. So there is a lot of trade in the area up into Kislev as well, and a lot of river trade. But up to this point, I would argue you that the river trade to the right doesn't exist and anyone that makes it exist either hasn't considered what's there or is just making shit up yeah yeah not everything remember not everything has to re revolve around reichland <laughs> yeah, it's a totally. tiny part of the empire 100 <laughs> percent agreed and I've, I've seen several attempts by people to try and make the stir and the reich navigable so you can go up from one and down to the other um and i generally think that that's fun and there's lots of things that people would have tried to do and i think that there's going to be engineering works and then uh, things that failed bits that have collapsed but there's giant waterfalls let the giant waterfalls be giant waterfalls make one of them um super important to tal for example or a local river god actually make it difficult for them to get around because that's more fun having everything uh, easy going from a to b is i think diminishing some of the enormity of the setting uh, all right. Uh, okay. So I, do, I do see a couple of random questions in chat that I think are worth just kind of pulling up. Uh, random. Do you guys own any Mordheim models? Um, I don't own any of the original for the setting of Mordheim focused minis, but I did play Mordheim using my Lizardman mini. So yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm sure Andy has <laughs> an unholy amount. Uh, and uh, I just like this comment, so I'm just magnifying it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> third way to heaven third way to heaven uh all right so uh first question of being uh oh oh yeah this is actually an interesting question that i think this okay this ties specifically into total war um which is that in total war they introduced the the whole thing of like the world roots where the the, the oak of ages has its world roots that pop up in certain forests yep, yep, that yep, allows yep. the wood else to travel in total war they introduced that the griffin wood which is right next to more time yep, uh just has sort of next to it, well, they, they, it, it north of it, it <laughs> north of it yes it, it is north of it but it's in that general ballpark um in total war they put it where it has one of the roots because that's where dry chest starts for just to give her an interesting start position um mm -hmm. and so the question here would be would the living world route have been affected by the comet that struck more time would it have been close enough uh for that to have been impacted so I'm going to say two things. Um, first, if you go by Mordheim lore, there's actually wood elves in the forest not too far away from Mordheim anyway, mm -hmm. um, which I find super fascinating, particularly because I'm uh, a great fan of obscure bits of lore. They mention wood elves in the Great Forest, and they mention a significant number of wood elves in the 
in the Drakvald of all places, um, which is something that is generally not considered to be the case um, in later editions or indeed earlier editions. They added more wood elves and they said that they were native to the Empire. They were not external, so they're not Azrai um, from Athaloran. And oh, they're, so they're, also, they're, they're kind of more like the Eonir then. And they're also not Eonir. Um, yeah. They're a different group. And that was something that I was intending on developing um, when I was doing the extra Wood Elfie bookie bits that I had planned when I was um, running the game. Um, and I almost certainly would have plumbed down in that a few small isolated communities. Man, that would have been fun. fascinating. And okay. That... And would I have connected that to the world route? And the answer is yes, because yes. Yeah, what they're, else? Yeah. <laughs> it's no, it, no, it's elves, yo. Um, yeah, because I mean, they're also over an Avalorn, okay, and they're connected through there, and that's high elves, okay, high elves, yo, okay, that they, they, they are a part of the elven um, culture and history that you would not wish to remove. Now, would a gigantic comet filled with warp stone slamming into a city relatively close to it make a difference? Arguably, yes, considering you're also on the, si the side of a massive wood there, which may also have um, uh, connections to the world roots. Um, indeed, the arrival of that comet almost certainly turned the um, hunger wood into the Verhungern that we know it um, as today. Mm. Um, so it almost certainly tainted that wood. But again, Warhammer World is really big, regardless of how small the Total War game may make it look. The distance between Mordheim and Griffin Wood is actually pretty fucking huge. The entirety of the Eerie Downs stands between it. And the Eerie Downs is this big, huge, massive open area, which is kind of haunted, kind of weird. Lots of old um, issues with undead because of Sylvania just to the south. Um, it became really bad when the arrival of the comet hit. Um, it's really far away. So um, in terms of it connecting to that one and me saying yes, yeah, probably not. It's far enough away that the impact of that crater, because it was not a proper meteorite, don't think of it as one. This was literally Bellacor arriving. So it's not a proper one that's designed to destroy the world. Bellacor's arrival was not a standard impact hit. That big massive explosion didn't wipe out the city completely that a two mile high pillar of fire would have done. It's hmm. Bellacor with a bunch of Sigmarites praying like mad to try and stop it. It may have killed many millions of folk, but it was certainly not as powerful as a comet of its size should have been. Um, so I think my answer is, contrary to my own preference, Probably not. Yeah, but but I like the idea that there might have it's been awesome. another world route closer by that might have been affected. Uh, <laughs> but <hell>. even <laughs> sure, Lock Holmes. Thank you, Hammond. Uh, Fucking uh, hell. One of the things that amuses me most about Benedict Cumberbatch is that I see him not frequently, but frequently enough because I think some of his family lived not more than about, I don't know, 500 meters away from my house. Um, so he's often seen kicking around a, a part of Edinburgh. And I'm like, oh, look, it's Benedict Cumberbatch. I, I ran him. I wonder if he knows that like everybody likes to make him techless because the the total war, you know because the total war warhammer the version they designed of him looks very similar to Benedict Cumberbatch. There you go. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but yeah, so that's super interesting. Uh, I will say though the follow up question of would the comment that have hit Mordheim affect the weave? Fuck yeah, that would have affected the weave big time. That. That's fucking with like so much of the world's natural balance, which if you fuck with the natural balance, the weave is going to go, uh, which is going to get the Azrae a little upset. Damn freaking straight it will. Uh, hey, Hammond. Andy, don't forget, Americans, Europeans have a different view on what is considered far away, though. That's true. Um, but it is where, I mean, it's a big distance, far more so than the impact crater would drop. Hey, Wrath of Woo! God, please, 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 please. I love Thank that you, name, Wrath Hey, Rath. Uh, first time catching this live. Thank you for the great lore content. Do any creatures unique the city leave Mordheim and cause destruction? Oh, you should pick that one up because we yes, were discussing I was actually before, just about to, there yeah. questions about I was going to answer. But yes, uh, so there are creatures that in Total War, they got given a slightly different name, which is they're called the Things in the Wood. Uh, but they are more commonly known as Beowulfs. Um, yeah. And the Beowulfs of Mordheim are a really freaky creature because when you look at them, they kind of look like weird wolves with like skull heads. But what they actually are in the story is they are people who became horribly infected by some kind of weird mutation that turns them into functionally werewolves with werewolves. exposed skulls and fluids leaking out of them and exposed muscle. And they're awful. They're horrible, horrible creatures. Um, but they do howl, which is how they got the name of wolves. And they're vaguely wolfish in appearance. They have like fur 
that you could see between the exposed bits of flesh and muscle and whatever. But the thing that's terrifying about them that total war does not actually showcase is that it's a disease technically. And it spreads. If you get bitten by a Beowulf, you will turn into a Beowulf. And it is say that sounds like you're saying Beowulf, like the old. Oh no, no, Beowulf. not Beowulf. <laughs> Beowulf. Beowulf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I really like the Beowulfs. I think they're awesome because um, they're another example of how Games Workshop doesn't really know what it wants to do with werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's tried so well, many different versions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and literally every type of werewolf you can get is in Warhammer somewhere in one version of the game. Um, and it's another version um, where obviously it's got the spreading aspect to it, which is super fun. Um, I really like them. And it also it, it shows that Warhammer doesn't just need to be, oh, look, here's another Night Goblin. Oh, look, here's another zombie. Here's another standard creature that's come out of one of the army lists it shows that there is a plethora of crazy weird creatures out there and it's really nice to see them uh express yeah and what's really interesting is i actually do like how they kind of interpreted it for total war warhammer of that three over the last 300 years these things have spread which they are literally called things in more time so calling them things in the woods is appropriate but a, mm -hmm. that they escaped from more time which makes sense especially because it's infectious and yeah. were became things that can be found in the dark horrible woods of ostermark which then led up into kislev but that over the over these centuries they in some way shape or form became bound to the spirits that live within those places enough that the hags are able to form packs with them um which is Perfect. not cool with that yeah I that's like. actually pretty reasonable um yeah. And they for, for the hags, they would make pretty horrifying fucking things to call upon, especially oh, yeah. because they're physical, which is very bad. <laughs> so I actually like that a lot. Uh, the, the idea of the hag sending one after somebody and all it has to do is bite you or scratch you enough and you're doomed to become one. That is excellent horror. I fucking love that. That's great. That's all. Yeah, they're great. What's next? Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, okay, so this is an interesting question, uh, though it's simple, which is Jiggy asks, is Mordheim an exception to what y'all have talked about in the past where warp stone can manifest naturally? But what we've kind of talked about is it's not really warp stone. Um, yeah. And also, there was a finite amount of it. Yeah. Um, so if you want to just be relatively um, objective about it, to try and separate all the details that are said uh, in the setting and people's attempt to understand it within the setting and just look at it for what actually happened. A chunk of Warpstone is removed from Morsleib by Bellacor. Bellacor is inside that Warpstone because it's a piece of pure chaos. It comes down and on impact shatters into lots of smaller parts. This, unfortunately, is the downfall of Bellacor's greater plan because he is in all of it. Um, and he's spread across, but his manifestation within it turns that warp stone to effectively weird stone um, and allows it to be manipulated much more easily than normal warp stone. If you pick up a chunk of warp stone, you're going to mutate. You pick up a bit of warp stone from Mordheim, and you probably won't. The weird stone that was gathered around Mordheim was very different. Um, and whilst a lot of it was obviously a lot smaller, the huge chunks that I'm getting and picking up, they were like tiny little shards and stuff that were getting sold for enormous quantities of money. Um, they were going over and weighing it and doing stuff with it. Some people were using special attempts to try and uh, pick it up using heavy gloves or whatever because it's dangerous. They all know it's dangerous. It's magical, but it's not as dangerous as the work. Yeah, and, uh, and, and kind of a thing is that a lot of writers kind of goof it in that you'll find in some uh different like black library novels and stuff they'll treat weird stone warp stone like it's the exact same thing and that's more just a miscommunication between different authors over the last 40 plus years oh if i got some audio weirdness let me bang my mic and annoy everyone um uh, apologies if you're all good now. Good. It was, yeah you're good now um good. michael thank you very very much for the generous super chat thank you good to you see rock, you michael. michael you're the best oh yeah uh, kind of all right uh okay so we talked about the bale wolf so i can skip all those questions um mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so Jiggy has a question of, and I think we kind of answered that this, that it's more due to licensing problems of, would there ever be a possibility of seeing a Mordheim-focused and Warhammer Fantasy roleplay 4th edition? 
yes, there, there's a possibility of it if the licensors, whoever have it, which I presume is going to be Cubicle 7 for some time now, given they've done a new deal, um, buy the license for more time. Now, it's very possible Games Workshop itself might decide that more time is no longer a separate license. They might just go, nah, you've got Warhammer, away you go. But when I was doing it, more time was very much a separate license that was handled completely discreetly. And it meant that any development towards more time um, would require a separate license. So someone else, I imagine, could probably go along and ask for it. Could the Rookery Publications buy the license? I have, <laughs> we have no desire to do that. We're quite happy being post <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, um, also, for the Emperor on the Car Fund, I agree. Thanks very thank much. Thank you, Elemental. Really appreciate that. Thank you, you so much. You rock. Um, thank you. So, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it would be cool to see. I think it'd actually make for a really fun campaign book, especially if they made it kind of like an in-tier area where you could have high-level characters and it's like super fucking dangerous. Uh, mm -hmm. That could be quite fun. Um, uh, we've talked about the Sisters of Sigmar and stuff. Uh, the actual Sisters of Sigmar aren't around anymore, but there are some orders that are kind of descended from them in a sense. I wouldn't say that they aren't. I'd say that they're in a state of um, uncertainty. They're the Schrodinger's order. Um, <laughs> Schrodinger's order. Um, in that, it's very possible that they will exist somewhere in the Warhammer world just simply because they existed previously and a later writer will go, I want to use them. Um, so I wouldn't say that they don't exist. I'd say that as it currently stands, we have no proof they exist. There you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've already answered all of these. Uh, oh, okay. This is kind of a fun question from Jiggy. Uh, Jiggy's last question of, uh, we already know it's bad in other parts of the world, but what would Geheimnis not be like in Mordheim? Bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think it's worth saying that the amount of weird stone that's kicking around in Mordheim would mean that more often than not, Morslieb is going to be there, present, a possibly full more commonly than it is anywhere else. Come Geheimisnacht and come Hexenstacht, it's going to be full, large, and probably bigger and nastier than it is anywhere else. Now, there's lots of different reasons for why this may be the case. But as is explained in multiple sources across the lore, places that are heavily magical or heavily tainted tend to have Morslieb full and sometimes permanently full. Mm -hmm. So I would see no reason why that wouldn't be the case. If, for example, I were to send my PCs in my Lawhammer game that I'm running online just now <laughs> over there, um, they, and they were to wipe them. <laughs> I mean, if they were stupid enough to decide that that was a good place to go, damn straight, Morsley would be full when they got there and its baleful influence would be felt. Um, more time is not a safe place. God, I really want someone to do a Photoshop edit of the the Lawhammer gang in like the style of It's Always Sunny and It's Always Sunny. The, the gang goes to more time. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, that, that would be a thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, it would be bad. Uh, plus, I mean, that's a place that's so tainted by magic um, where the dead never rest easy and demons could appear literally very, very easily. So it's yeah. awful, super awful. Um, all right. Uh, okay. There's a lot of goof questions in here. Um, <laughs> people, uh, which, okay. I just want to add, Andy sometimes knows the most obscenely tiny details. So I'm just curious if any of these would okay. have them though. I can answer that. Or if he just thinks they're all stupid questions too. So Biofoot asks, what would the municipal water system be like in more time? Right. So it's an old city. Um, that much yeah, we know. You. Um, uh, we know that it's got, it had a massive extensive library. In fact, the biggest building in more time was its enormous library. Um, we know that it was at the forefront, um, of politics and the empire as a whole. We also know that it's very close to the world's edge mountains. These small combinations of facts loosely leave you with an, a very clear, it had sewers, very clear because it's a big city in Warhammer. Um, and at this era, they had sewers because they'd had them almost since the beginning. And the video game, they had Empire. sewer baths. Yeah, Warhammer. totally. Okay, so they have sewers. So do they have a water system? The answer immediately comes up with, yes, they absolutely do. Um, we know that they've got sewers, which means they've got piping systems, which means that they're going to be, just with the very basic understandings of gravity, capable of even piping water into places. They're going to have water pressure. So the answer is that it did, does it after the explosion? Well, I reckon there's probably a good location or two that you could build out of some cisterns or some underground horrible uh, uh, mess of a sewer system. So the answer is probably to all of that, yes. Okay, and I'm also Hammond dropped in there. 
Hey, Hammond. And the Lord Celestial said, Woe be to those who touch Weird Stone and my Weird Son. Don't touch his Weird Son, guys. That's Don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't touch people's Weird Sons. <laughs> Just leave them alone. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip the rest of these goofy questions, even though I know Andy can answer them. I'm going to skip them. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Servant of Sin. If Gelt was knocked out and stripped of all his possessions and slapped into Mordheim, would he survive? Mandatory Gelt question achieved. Thank you. I would say he probably would. He's a skilled wizard. I I'm going from turning to spawn because it's the only thing he deserves. <laughs> Uh, what is the fishman's relationship with Mordheim? We already answered that. There's a river and uh, uh, there are things in there. It's actually very well documented, especially because there's a big thing down there with tentacles that is actually super dangerous. Uh, eats a lot of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, who is the best Mordheim faction? Ooh, that's a spicy question. How long is a piece of string? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's really down to personal taste. I mean, when uh, the game reached its coming, I mean, now there's like like thirty factions sitting in there. If you go through all the various, literally factions. everyone and then so, some. <laughs> yeah, totally. If you look at all the factions that were added by the town crier over time, and then finessed because some of them got gently changed with a rat over the course of time. You had everything from the ones that we all know are pit fighters and our cults of the possessed, our skaven or whatever. But we also had a pretty much every province of the empire given a faction. The Tillians mm. given a faction. Dark elves given a faction. High elves given a faction. Different clans of Skaven given a faction. The Restless Dead given a faction. There are so many. And it really just comes down to which one do you like most. Um, and I don't think any of them are particularly better than any of the others because quite a lot of balancing went into them over the course of time because the game got played a lot. I will say if you uh, put... I, I Through my personal experience, if you take a bunch of Grognard, uh, or however you properly say it, because uh, uh, I can't say it right, but if you get a bunch of uh, angry old people that played more time back in the day in a room and you gave them a gun with five bullets, they would shoot the guy that played High Elves five times. <laughs> <laughs> high Elves are awesome. I mean, it's almost like Thomas really loved the High Elves or something. <laughs> yeah. I, I will never forget being a 12-year-old in my local hobby store and listening to old dudes bitch about the guy who had three three little high elf models and he was wiping out entire war bands which as i recall i'm quite right too as i recall though i think um thomas um played with the uh i'm pretty sure he played with witch hunters um and he ended up releasing a whole bunch of extra witch hunter rules um ones that he considered for the game but didn't put in because he'd already given them everything already <laughs> um <laughs> So yeah, totally. Uh, shit's funny. Um, uh, some random questions I do see from the chat. Uh, someone, uh, uh, Theona Jesus, Theon, Theona Jesus. I love that. Ask, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the cult of the possessed? The one Jesus. Oh, the one. The Jesus. one. Oh, that makes more sense. Uh, okay, so <laughs> oh, oh, that's not that's not the right one. I got the wrong one. It's the one just um, above that. There it is. There it is. There it is. There. I'm gonna let you take that one away because I don't actually know that much about them off the top of my head. Um, I didn't use the cult of the possessed, if I'm honest. Um, uh, all I remember is that they were the mutants. I haven't even bothered reading up on them. Actually, before, I think but... they're, I think they're the Bellacore faction. Um, um they uh, let demons into themselves, if I remember correctly, is their gimmick. I can't remember, which is really annoying. Um, will, okay, there's always will, one question that throws me. I'll go. Check I will it say, up. I do remember. I do remember they have characters that are the concept of humans that are possessed by demons and get strong. I'll also say that I do remember, just at the weird facts, that they, um, their cult leaders were called Magisters, as I recall, which was really interesting because um, I had a discussion with Games Workshop back in the day about whether we could use the word Magister um, for Wizards of the Empire. Um, and they fling between saying, yes, that's what the Wizards of the Empire are called, the ones in the College of Magic, or Magisters, to fling on the other side. No, Magisters are chaos, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just possessed. Um, and, and, and they're most definitely not to be used for that. So you'll find that different role-playing books will either use Magister or not for that. Yeah, never mind. Uh, I like. I do know a lot about them because they're the playable faction in the video game. They are the Bellacore faction. They um, are the Bellacore faction. Yeah, Good. they're they're the servants of the Dark Master, and they have a very specific gimmick around. Some of them allow themselves to be possessed by demons, which is a documented thing that can happen in Warhammer. It's rare, but it does exist within certain groups it, 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 it happens a lot with bellacore because bellacore does a lot of possession as well um him and his entire crew do a lot of possession um as i recall weren't they the ones that um they had like entire rituals around the whole idea that uh they viewed mutation 
um, was obviously blessed, but they almost didn't like stigmata, like the idea of blood flowing from them. But for them, it was the mutation that flowed free from them, the stigmata of the flesh. Oh, it's so what long ago since I've read that, though. So, yeah, um, which by the way, thought. this is a totally random aside. We are not sponsored or anything by them. The Mordheim video game is fucking fantastic. Oh, yeah, great Brutal. game. Yeah. You can get it for two dollars right now, uh, yeah. until the first week of November. It's two dollars, it's normally like 20 or something. It's a fucking awesome game. It's brutal, yeah. but it's fun as fuck. Um, it's fun. But uh, yeah, Cult of Possessed, actually a really fascinating group uh, because they value possession very heavily, which is not something you see a lot in Warhammer because possession is often hard to do correctly. It usually kills the person almost immediately and a demon will usually like explode out of them and it's bad. Um, but, the idea uh, here is that there's a host of rituals um, attached to it and religious aspects to it that allow the mutation to settle, well, pardon me, the possession to settle without immediate death, which is super fun. Um, and it also anything that stands contrary to the established rule is always fun for Warhammer. So if the established rule is if you get possessed, you die quickly, there's always going to be someone out there who has figured out how to do it better. And the idea that Belakor, that effectively the god of Chaos Undivided, has found a method of allowing possession to occur because he's not, for example, deep into the excess of Slaanesh, which causes it to go completely out, completely out of control uh, or some alternative for each one of the other chaos powers it um it gives that particular god a unique character and i really like it yep uh and then the famir question uh i don't think they had a war band but i would be shocked if there were not famir that appeared in wartime yeah i'm pretty sure they didn't as i recall um, I'm going through my head here and I can't remember any. I mean, the Femur went through a period of being absolutely unacceptable to use under any circumstances, even though they'd been used in Hero Quest, it was effectively a kid's game. Um, and part of that was a pushback against Hero Quest because several people who found out what the Femur origins were and how nasty they were um, and why it was in a kid's game pushed hard. And it meant that there was a certain ickiness attached to the entire species. Me personally, if I was writing the game today, I wouldn't include them. I just wouldn't, mm. because for some people um, who have been through the horrors that um, the game uh, gave for the Fimmer, um, it's just an unacceptable choice. So I'd be happy dumping them. So I'm not surprised they weren't used, but equally I'm not surprised that they haven't been taken and turned into something different. Hey, yeah. Sharbs! I do enjoy my Fimmer, but only the new version that has had all that stuff scrubbed out, and the deeper that gets buried, the happier I'll be. Uh, Sherbs, thank you for being awesome. Helping me digest this material. Dyslexia can be a bitch sometimes. Any recommendations yeah. for a first audiobook? My recommendation is always Go Trek Felix, which has been getting a lot of really awesome attention on uh, audiobooks these days. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna highlight myself as someone who has quite a lot of reading comprehension issues. I read very, very slowly. I'm quite neurodivergent, but we don't discuss that here. <laughs> um, but I also don't use audiobooks because I like trying to slowly but surely make my way through books and novels because I'm I'm stubborn. Um, but I cannot recommend the Kotrek and Felix books enough either. They're a lot of fun. So it's a really good place to begin. Yeah, and they've they've been very aggressively pursuing it like the last yeah. two or three years. So the entire series is almost on Audible now. It's very nice. Yeah. Well worth um, it. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So, okay, we already answered all those. Um, uh, okay, kind of an interesting question by Surrogate Gaia. Uh, I agree, Biofoot. Uh, yes. And, Definitely. Uh, honestly, agreed. and we, we owe a lot of the thanks to that for uh, that they've been salvaged in any way to, to um, wolf rip. In that it it did. I, I would say sense. that um, if we're going to pop it down to a single book, I would say it was the um, Storm of Magic book, which brought them ah, back. That's okay. Like that's one of point. the summonable creatures, um, and dropped them in there. Um, their inclusion in there meant that when we did Warhammer, I could say precedent in Warhammer Eight to use it. I would like to use it again, and I would like to not just smooth off those edges take away those edges please thanks very much yeah um and and i'm really glad that, that so, storm out. magic and then forge world um they they cleaned yeah. up and put out a lot and they really cleaned it up absolutely totally um all right uh let's see here uh surrogate guy asks after magnus raised the city was there anything really left of it in the current age uh go raise yes. city of the damned go check field city of the damned it literally tackles more time in the modern modern timeline and the answer is loosely yes. Uh, let's see, <laughs> Doctor. Okay, this is this is a goof question, but it has a genuinely interesting answer. <laughs> Doctor Bloody Four Gorst asks, "What is the taxation percentage an average Mordheimer has to pay 
in gold or warp shards. You joke, but in the little shanty town to build up around warp stone, there were oh, yeah. brutal taxations trying to get weird stone shards from people, um, which are actually reflected if you played the tabletop game or the video game where a percentage of your gold and the warp uh, weird stone shards were you lost them to the various groups and political factions around more time that you had to deal with in order to survive. So yeah, taxation is just a part of life. And just because the place is a hellhole, you, if anything, will get, get taxed more. <laughs> yeah, even in the realm of chaos, some asshole will figure out how to get taxes to work. Damn straight. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, mm, I don't really know where that question's asking, so I'm going to skip it. Um, uh, okay, Malasar asks, why were the Sisters of Sigmar the only really female-centric order of Sigmar? Everywhere else that I've seen, Sigmarites are pretty chauvinistic, but in the city of hell, the girls were the only loyal and faithful ones. Why wasn't this replicated anywhere else with any other order of Sisters of Sigmar? Type it has order? been. And, and, it has been. Yeah, like, we've talked about the Sisters of Faith and, uh, faith and cha Charity that I added to um, Tome of Salvation. That's another one. Yeah, and that's I second did. edition Wolfram, which was uh, a while it ago. Is so that's second edition Warfare. So I added them in, and they were also one of the first ones to get to the um, signs that the end times were coming. Um, and they moved from being a standard nun order into being a warrior priestess order because they realized that the end times were coming. So they became a warrior priestess order that were getting ready for war. Their armor was covered with uh, uh, thorns tip to toe. If you want to see an image of them, go check the uh, Blood on the Reich image. Um, the Blood on the Reich book that came from Black Library. Um, mm -hmm. It's got all the concept art that was made for one of the old Warhammer uh, online games. And that included Sisters of, Sisters of Sigma that had wrapped thorns all around them to keep people away from them and um, that's super fun uh, but yeah there, there's quite a few of them it's just that uh, because often these games are written by men for men or boys for boys depending how you want to look at it they often forget girls even exist um so uh, sad but true and it takes a certain amount of uh ex different writers bringing different things to the table for you to realize just how bad and sexist the people who've created the material are often accidentally being um one of the reasons why i often co-write with my wife and a lot of things is that i will write it on she'll come in and say what the fuck are you doing and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. Uh. Um, she's like, Why did you do it like this? And then I explain it, and then she'll argue, and then we'll get ourselves different points in place. Hey, Mandatus, Mandatus. Oh, yeah, we already spoke to you earlier. Yes, thank you uh, again uh, very much. Uh, there's an awesome mod for Warhammer 3 that brings the more time cult into Bellacor's faction. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, cool. I'll have to check that out. That's cool. I, I will definitely check that out. Yeah, for uh, which uh, you kind of mentioned that if you play the more time video game, the spe each of the factions kind of has a special character. Um, the head cultist for Bellacor is a woman who is fucking terrifying. She's got a really good design, too. Um, the the Magisterix. Uh, she is awesome. Magistrix. Magistrix, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm American. I don't pronounce things <laughs> correctly. <laughs> um, hey, it's uh, an Italian word, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, uh, we, we answered all these already. We, uh, we talked about the, um, the big uh, angry oak. Um, which mm -hmm. presumably I would imagine either it starved out over the years when people stopped coming to Mordheim or it was destroyed by Magnus and his crew when they rolled up. That's probably one of the things I, they would have smited. I imagine, I imagine it exists to this day in that, some form, in some fashion, um, perhaps trapped away in a shard of time or some equivalent. According to um, the war, it actually does because it's a landmark. Yeah, to bring it back, totally. It's called yeah, the Rampaging uh, Oak, but... Uh, definitely uh, not the Wamping Willow. Yeah, no, actually significantly scarier. Um, yeah. uh, let's see. Are you guys hoping to see from the bloke person any more time stuff make its way into the old world? Yes, I think we've actually talked about that Definitely. a fair number of times. And a I lot of the, hope that's the, case. the yeah. studio's in a position where it can use all of that lore freely and without any restrictions. So I'm hoping that a good chunk of it passes through, largely because it is such an influential location and is at the very heart of what is occurring at the Old World, in that the Old World game is ultimately the next rise of chaos as the incursion comes. Um, and the last one was more time. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's Magnus is to the modern Warhammer what more time is to Magnus. Yep. Uh, Bulk person... Also, is there any lore you can give me on Aonur, the Sword of Twilight? 
which does oh, not ring a bell for me. I should have read that one up. I haven't read about Ian here for ages. All I remember is he was a high elf that was kicking around women. Wasn't he? Oh, he was a sword master. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm running through my brain now. Oh, Wait, I can't remember this... enough of him. I just remember he was a sword master. Um, gosh darn it. That's really annoying that I can't remember. Of it. I should have read this all up beforehand. That would have been useful. Um, no, okay, he's not the elf I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of a different elf. Yeah, he was um, a sword master, and I can't remember his rules. We can pick that up in a separate one. Um, yeah. Sorry. Well, but, feel free to ask us again in the future, because now that we've had it of, yeah, like, we can't remember. Model. I, I converted that model twice into two different elves. It was really cool. I haven't read that for a long time. <laughs> well, ask us next time. <laughs> yeah, next time. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, what happened to the Sisters of Sigmar after Magnus the Pious raised Mordheim? Did any other Sigmarite temples try to establish them? Uh, we kind of talked about uh, they're, they're, because they're a Mordheim thing, nobody else really got played around with them that much, but yeah. it's likely there are descendants destroyed. that have survived it's likely the, the, the core order is probably destroyed and that there's probably remnants of it in a variety of different fashions elsewhere. I think the idea of the uh, seer and the augurs that they had almost certainly lives on in a variety of different ways. Yeah, especially if you think about the fact that they had Ostermark's Rune Fang, it had to get out of there somehow, and they are probably the ones that delivered it, which means they probably survived into some other part of Ostermark at the very least. Mm. Uh, let's see. Hearn, um, has there ever been a legitimate attempt to resettle Mordheim? No. Uh, I would not think so. Maybe, but it would be a damn fool's errand. Yeah, to that. Um, I imagine there's been all manner of folk who have made various forays into the place. It's the classic example would be a little comic that says, oh, we're going to creep into more time because of all the great treasures that are there. Or they happen to um, be making their way up to, say, Valdenhof, a um, relatively mm. important town that's on uh, Sylvania. And you have to pass through, um, you have to literally pass through good old Dread More Time to get there by boat. Um, and I can imagine that being a super fun scenario. The horrors that you have to eventually hide from as you glide your way through mm. the ruins that lie to either side. So resettling seems exceedingly unlikely, but it wouldn't surprise me if some foolish bandits have, have tried to hold themselves up there at various points and they have probably died or become something worse because of their foolishness. Um, it'll start off a little bit, you know, oh, it's fine. And then the creaks and then the awfulness and one of them disappears. You get the <laughs> idea. There is a story to be told there. Yep. I, I will say if you wanted to do a really fun role play thing, uh, you could do the idea of someone who is like secretly a cultist or wants to do something involving knowing Bellacor's there trying to sell the idea of oh we should just go resettle it like it's got all this stuff here we could go like salvage it or whatever and he's like using people to get him into the city and get closer that could be a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh let's see um i just looked up Ener just as a small aside and fortunately my memory wasn't that bad sort of twilight fuck very little is known about him other than he's a really tall elf <laughs> who may have been a from the legendary order of swordmasters so i'm feeling rather pleased with myself for barely remembering anything because the the character himself is mysterious having wiped out entire bands by himself so yes not a lot that can be said on top of yeah, that yeah there, there's another question about him from uh loopy which is what is anir's obsession with mordheim what keeps him there and that i don't know if that's known I, I, and I don't think it will be, but I think that uh, I think the obsession aspect is the answer. Obsession comes hand in hand with what the weird stone was doing to everybody in the place. What keeps them there? You could argue that the answer is the same answer for everyone else. Bellacor. Mm. You know, he shouldn't be there if he was wise. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, why should Bretonia be added if there's a new Mordheim skirmish game? Uh, Bretonia was a playable faction if you use the extended rules. They were fucking hilarious because they took cavalry into Mordheim, which was yep. so stupid. But the actual knights were super strong. You can only have yeah. like one or two per warband. But they, if they actually could get to someone on their horse, it was very rare they would not whoop the shit out of them. Um, Town were Crier, scary. number eight. Town Crier, number eight. I remember yeah. that one. Very peasant heavy warband. Uh, when most warbands had like a big creature you could have, like the Skaven could have a rat ogre, or the Cult of Possessed could have a chaos spawn. For the Bretonians, they could have a knight, <laughs> which is hilarious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, this is kind of an interesting question from Gree. 
Did Mordheim's destruction prompt the Empire to ward their cities much better from potential magical destruction? Or did they have any kind of security measures or do anything to potentially prevent something like that from happening? No. Yep. And I think there is something to say that there's a lot of arrogance to humans. Like, think about our world. When a tragedy happens to a city, you would figure everybody would go, oh, we need to make sure that doesn't happen to us. And Okay, I'm going to give a different answer. Okay, the answer is no, because that's the actual answer. They didn't do anything special. However, it was used as an object lesson by the Cult of Sigmar. Um, this is what happens when you become lost. There's a variety of awfulness that was happening in Mordheim, and then the Hammer of Sigmar comes down and blows them all up. See, Sigmar was punishing them. So what did they do to shield against it in future? Uh, more aggressively pursued their Sigmarite agenda. Yeah, 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 yeah that's fair. Yeah, it it it. Probably, so really, they did nothing. <laughs> yeah, it might tie a little bit into um, the the cult of Sigmar kind of strengthening its grip, especially like the um, the uh, cult of the cleansing flame or the order of the cleansing flame uh, groups yeah. like that. It wouldn't really be. I mean, it wouldn't really be properly until the arrival of the colleges of magic 300 plus years later um that they were really in a position where they could start thinking about the concept of warding before that you'd have been left with dwarf runes and uh, dwarf runes are not exactly known for uh, resolving astrological events <laughs> um dwarves themselves being an underground people so they're focusing on things that affect them earthquakes cave-ins they are the disasters that, would... that the dwarves are dealing with um i have to say that would no, genuinely no. be the funniest secret master rune for someone to find is a master rune very specifically against <laughs> meteors and comets like what <laughs> why, did they make this? why did they make it yeah totally so the alternative would have been effectively cult magic or divine magic if you wish to use the word magic along with that miracles and the like so now we're talking about holy people doing prayers chants rituals and of course they do that sort of stuff the problem with a lot of that is though it's hokum and bunkum um a lot of it isn't actually summoning the god at all um, the vast majority of their worshipers aren't really all that holy because it's the warhammer world and it's kind of broken um so yeah, uh, yeah. with funny random insight to our personal conversations me and andy have had some back and forths about sigmarism in regarding yeah. my witch hunter uh, which has been funny of that. There are things that my witch hunter would disagree very much with Andy about how Sigmarism works and how, how the religion is supposed to function, which is but really that's funny. The, that's the nature of it. It's all uh, it's all in character, so to speak. Yes. Uh, what is the objective truth? The objective truth is a difficult thing to find. Um, Dr. Bloody, what additional factions would you want to see added into Mordheim uh, if the old world made it brought the game back? Um, okay, I so I don't know if there's anything the town criers missed. <laughs> yeah, so the factions that are offered by all the town criers really do give you a little bit of everything, ranging from Kislevites to Tillians. They don't have an Estallian one, as I recall. Maybe no Estallians, but they're basically any old world nation that hasn't been mentioned, you could throw them in. Um, However, if I was looking at it as a whole, I'd be looking at um, adding extra characters. So you want to do things like adding cool rat catchers because that's such a common thing from Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So you'd want to include those. They also stand as a nice um, counterpoint to Skaven. So uh, different versions of wizards. There was actually a surprising lack of... Um, the winds of magic and exactly how they would manifest mm. in lots of different ways. I'd maybe add those in as extra dramatis, dramatis personae, for example, some extra cool characters or hirelings or some equivalent. So there's lots of things you could add, but I think in terms of the overall quantity of material that's already been added, um, it's got an almost embarrassment of wealth in terms of how much there is there that you can play. You could play a league and have everybody in like a 30 person league play a completely different faction. So yeah, I highlight this because the last Rookery episode I watched. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the good old small but vicious dog. <laughs> yeah, I will say uh, I would kill for a Cathay faction. Uh, I think they could do a lot of really fun things with Cathay. They could even have multiple Cathay ones from like the different yeah, good arts. Um, or like they their... already had Cathayans in there though, so it's not like they were never mentioned. Um, yeah, I would want to see the new versions. Like yeah, that'd be like cool. Onyx Chroman showing up in Cath uh, Mordheim would be that cool. far away. That'd be pretty awesome. Uh, it'd be impressive, but uh, I don't know. I, I I think they could pull it off, <laughs> but uh, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Um, but uh, yeah, just modernize it. You know what I would need? 
gnomes. <laughs> now that they're, uh, they're officially back, as far as I'm concerned, I, I would character. definitely, if I was doing it, I would definitely include a single gnome character, um, yeah. uh, a, sh a shadow wizard who had come from. Um, yes, a gaggle yeah. of crowmen. Thank you, Potrack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, gaggle of freaking crowmen. Uh, Radiant Ash, thank you very much for the raid, by the way. Really appreciate it. We're just answering hey! questions about more time. Yeah, now. we're just coming what? to the end of our more time questions. Uh, Sigma uh, God and Sulkin versus Talus God, and I'm not going to pronounce it. I don't know enough Big about line. the Elder Scrolls Lord to answer that. <laughs> yeah, neither do I, All sadly. Right. Um, I know bits and bobs, but I wouldn't like I don't to even, say yeah, yes. I don't even know who Gigolo is. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who that god is. Um, uh, I know who Talos is. I don't like that. That looks like a Daedric god, but I don't recall that one, which means I maybe they're not a Daedra. Um, so I'm just going to bring that and see. Of course it freaking yeah. is. Why didn't they do that in the novel? The, and instead, yeah. they said a gaggle of crowmen. I have myself a soapbox I'm about to climb on. No, no, we don't have time. <laughs> uh, yes, text brief, you are correct. There were at least two notable errors in the short story about the Chroman that are very funny, but also sad, but mostly funny. <laughs> and that was one of them, is they're crows and they got called a gaggle. <laughs> oh, no. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay, this is a really interesting question. Laughing God has dropped in with a Wuxia-inspired Cathay martial artist exploding heart, a rat ogre. That could be quite fun. We are still desperately waiting for the Total War DLC that gives us the Dragon Monks. I'm so excited for the Dragon Monks. We know they exist. We just need to get them. Uh, Jigalag is the uh, Daedric Prince of Order. Oh, okay. I mean, oh, thank you. I don't know enough. Sorry, I don't know enough about power scaling. And I think power scaling between universes is usually an effort of futility anyway. But uh, okay. uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Hammond. Um, so, okay, Lally, really Superman. interesting question here. Are there other Mordheims around the Warhammer world? Uh, cities that got pummeled by Warpstone meteors or other unique um, natural disaster or natural uh, disasters um, that made them into something like Mordheim, or is Mordheim a very unique place? I would say yes and yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Mordheim is the uh, only city that Bellicor impacted into. I'll put it that way. Yeah. So Mordheim is absolutely unique in that it's where a chaos god attempted to become a overlord of all and failed. Um, and that makes it by its very nature unique. That's the story that was being told there. Um, however, on the other side, have other parts of the Warhammer world been struck by gigantic comics and comics? Comets <laughs> and changed them forever? The answer is again. Yes, if we're talking, just say the mall from our previous stream when we discussed the mall. That's how it was created. And that may have landed upon the equivalent of an ogre city. Um, the mall is just another example of what these great events can cause. Um, it became something very different. Just think of what more time could have become under slightly different circumstances. If, for example, Bellacor had largely succeeded, it would effectively have become another chaos gate. Um, that would have massively changed the world. A new god would have formed there. So the answer is loosely yes. We've got lots of examples of comets. We've got lots of examples of their impacts where the story has yet to be fully told. I'll give a single example. No, I'll give two examples. Um, and just the Empire alone. And this is just one part of the world. Um, I won't go for the obvious Barren Hills option. I'll go for first Talapheim. Talapheim that is called the Eye in the Forest as a city. Um, and that's because it's in the center of a gigantic crater. And the entirety of the river Talabek that comes out from there is said to have been created by the thrashing of the dragon um, that died there with the impact of that. So a mighty dragon, it was a warpstone meteor or some equivalent, <laughs> strikes there, creates a 100-mile circumference crater um, and does that. If, however, we go up to Middenland and the border with Nordland into where the Ionir are, we have the Shadden Sump, which is an enormous, enormous swamp where the Fimmer were, all, were very first introduced uh, in a roleplay adventure. And the hmm. Shadden Sump um, is also the center of a truly enormous depression, which was caused by an impact. Um, and that, again, completely change it, changed that part of the world. We got ourselves an enormous cursed swamp, much like the cursed marshes, funnily enough, which mm. is possibly how the Fimmer themselves were wiped out, depending upon how one wants to look at it, or possibly how the Skaven were created. So loosely, the answer is, oh, hell yes, in all manner of different ways. Morslieb spits. 
Yeah. Hammond, what are you asking specifically with this question? Are you asking like if the Warhammer world has a big war, who's the winner? <laughs> like, I'm not I'm not sure I understand the question because it's it's like or just two Andes go toe to toe. Andy's fighting, yeah. <laughs> Andy and Dark and or no Andy and Moon Andy. Those are the two. Oh Andy. Moon Andy. <laughs> Moon Andy is pretty scary. <laughs> um all right, we're almost uh I think we only got like uh two or three more. Um, let's do two, three more and then call it an end. So let's see what our last yeah. few are. Um, okay, so Jack of the Eagle asked, could if if Bellicor had tried to possess something else, like an elf, a dwarf, or a dragon, could they have sustained him when the Ever Chosen could not? Super, super interesting. Now, the concept of the Ever Chosen was more than just the the body itself it was the very fact that it was the ever chosen and that's what mattered because the ever chosen is imbued with the powers of all four chaos powers plus the enormous artifacts that it has and that would have given bellicor extraordinary ultimate power but as i recall he didn't quite get the crown in the end um meaning that it didn't quite go according to plan mm -hmm. and obviously the body he got kicked out by the ever chosen there's a big long story there i can't remember it all off the top of my head but the reason that he was chosen was because of that and it failed so could other things have um Sustained them possibly, but that's not really the important question for Bellicor. The important question for Bellicor is how do I get all the power of the ever chosen? Because mm. that's what he wants. He wants to take that one last step because he's literally just a step away from absolute power. He's that close and he has found a route towards it. And that route is to take away a section of the power from the other four chaos powers. And the route that he has chosen is by basically taking the position, the mantle of ever chosen and, and combining that with the power that those four gods have already invested within him. It effectively makes them equal to them because he siphoned off like a quarter of their power each, meaning that he's created a new god out of them. It's mm. really clever. And it's, it's a pretty funky and cool way of pr uh, progressing. Could a dragon have he held him? Maybe. Um, there's all manner of rituals in the possessed, which we, I completely forgot the lore of earlier in the stream. Go figure. Because <laughs> um, that happens sometimes. You've got to forget something sometimes. Um, and there's clearly there uh, ways of possessing something that will last for time. It's not just that the Ever Chosen wasn't strong enough. It's that the Ever Chosen was also too strong and kicked him out. Um, I think it's a complicated situation that will almost certainly be tackled by someone else at some other point and rewritten yeah. into a different if place. anything i think the the follow-up question that would be very interesting to explore is does the ever chosen have to be a human uh which no. yeah which, i mean yes but no <laughs> <laughs> which uh that would be the fascinating idea to explore is because <laughs> I, I think honestly in bellicor's kind of pride he, i don't think he would settle for anything less than the ever chosen yeah, quite. I mean um can it be something beyond human the answer is yes because Archeon is not fully human um, now that's something that we'll pick up, I presume, in an Archeon stream at some point. But Archeon was sired by Bellicor, um, possessing someone else. Um, Archeon is quite literally Bellicor's kid, um, yeah. and is not fully human, not entirely not human, but not fully human. It's Do complicated, we have any... it's complicated. <laughs> exactly. He was possessing someone else, so he was in a human body, but it's more complicated than it appears. Archeon is not normal is basically what we start off with. He's different. Um, so we can have ourselves ever chosen that are definitely different. And would the Chaos Gods choose, for example, an elf that had fully fallen to them? Yeah, probably. But the problem with elves is that they're tricksy little fuckers. I wouldn't choose a, a never chosen that was an elf, if you ask me. Um, and what's the chance of a dwarf falling? Pretty low. But then we've got our Chaos Dwarves, but we know they're all about Hashat. It's got to be someone that all the Chaos work Gods are willing to channel their power into. And we all know that good old hobbits yeah, and... are going to be ignoring that. It's also very important that like the chaos gods are very jealous. Like they don't like ever chosen's occurring necessarily because they're very envious of each other and they're constantly trying to tempt that individual to them alone. They don't like to share. Indeed, but they equally know that it can't be an ever chosen. It won't work unless it's a it's a mess, really. Yeah, er, so yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> yeah, it's a mess. All right, a good uh, mess. Uh, the last two questions that we're gonna yes. ask, um number one. Yes. Uh, could Gotrek and Felix clear out more time? There's a book about that. Um, mm. Also, like, the, the amount of, like, plot murder that Gotrek's capable of? Probably. It doesn't really yeah. matter what you throw him at. He's going to win. <laughs> yeah, he, he has quite legitimate plot armor. Um, and then... Threaten into his rules. Gotrek's doom. Uh, yeah. He has plot armor. Uh, and then Hammond, actually, uh, over on Discord, hey, uh, I believe the last question of, 
Um, is there a website you could look at that gives you all the factions that were made for more time? Yes. Yeah, there's um, wikis um, wait a that have it. Wait a minute. I think Andy wait a minute. Pull it up. Wait a minute. Um, I'm going to pull up a really good one. It doesn't just give you all the fox factions that were ever written. It's done in a really easy to browse fashion. So let me just post that one in. I'll pop in the intro net to begin with. So you can click on that one. And I'll bring it up here as well. It's the moretimer.net. Um, moretimer.net is brilliant um, because it takes everything that was ever created for more time and just basically puts it all back out for you in a very easy to browse fashion. If you're on a tablet or an iPad or something similar, super easy to browse through in that. There's loads of funky details that I really wish I'd read before I started it. Um, so yeah, definitely pop over there. Excellent. And I think that's a oh, perfect it. place to end it. I uh, think so too. So uh, thank you all so much for coming by. This was a load of fun. Uh, I actually got to learn a shitload this stream because more time is one of the weaker uh, parts of my brain when it comes to Warhammer Fantasy. Um, just because I didn't get to play it that much, uh, unfortunately, because by the time I was like a uh, adult and playing, it was gone. <laughs> so, um, but uh, that being said, um, once again, we're not being sponsored by it, but the video game's on Steam for only $2 and it's very well made. One of the biggest heartbreaks for me is that game studio stopped um, adding to it mm -hmm. because they were doing a really great job. Uh, and then they went and made Necromunda, which sucked. Um, but <laughs> in any event, that's just game devs sometimes. I, I didn't enjoy Necromunda as much. Nah, in fact, nobody, I only played it for about 10 minutes. Nobody did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you really my cup of tea. yeah um, go figure. But um, uh, I'd also like to say, if you haven't already, make sure you click like if you're watching on YouTube just now. And if you're do. watching later, do remember to press subscribe as well, because Soltech needs absolutely all of you behind him waving banners, because that is <laughs> awesome. And if you have enjoyed it, do please click like and share. Go send it to other people. That'd be lovely. Yes. Uh, also, just a couple quick things. Uh, make sure you go subscribe over to Lawhammer. Uh, we are over 3K subs now. We're starting we to get very close to 5K. Queek's waiting. As soon as y'all hit that 5K, so Queek Head Taker. If you didn't know already, um, Sotek is working on a video for Queek Head Taker, who is the coolest of the cool. He does so much in his life. Um, you need to see this video, and it will be released when Lawhammer reaches the heady total of 5K subscribers. So if you want to go into a super deep dive lo lore swim through everything that is Queekish, I don't know why I'm swimming through Skaven. It sounds awful. Um, yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> that swarmy Stephen awesomeness, then all you need to do is go over there, click subscribe, and plus you could watch yourself a whole bunch of really interesting Warhammer Speaking Fantasy role play videos. Speaking of which, are y'all on tomorrow? Me? Or yes, we're on. we are on tomorrow. Yeah. Oh yeah, we are. And, Ooh, yeah, I'm next, to the next tomorrow's day. episode is going to be fucking insane. I am so <laughs> excited for tomorrow. It's not another flashback, is it? No, 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 no. no. I am insanely excited for tomorrow's episode. Um, yeah. and, uh, so check it out. Uh, there's a good number of episodes already, like 40 ish. Yeah. We're over 40 episodes now. Um, we're officially only on episode about 20, but a whole bunch of the episodes are side episodes where we take deep dives into individual characters. It's, it's brilliant. It's a lot of fun to watch. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of hilarity, a lot of heartbreak, <laughs> a lot of horror. Um, and, uh, there are some things the last a episode, lot of heresy <laughs> the last episode in particular i literally messaged andy of like that is the most heretical bullshit i have ever watched in my life this is heresy <laughs> oh and if you want to know more about magnus the pious watch our ones and go what the yeah, yeah the, good times yeah uh <laughs> that that is that is uh we you can tell we're reaching the point where uh Lawhammer is really branching off into a very unique story that would have that has the lore master of Sotek version of the story going, ah, bruh, 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 bruh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it's great, it's awesome, um, fantastic to watch. Um, I'm good old Gorkamorka. Yeah, I had a whole bunch of gangs for Gorkamorka, just as a small aside, just to end um, uh, off with there. Thanks very much, Zidron. Is it Zidron? Zidron? Uh, Davis. This is John Davis. Um, to John Davis. Um, yeah, I played Gorka Morka a lot. I was working for Games Workshop at the time, so it was uh, an easy thing to do because I had a pretty hefty discount, so I had a lot of freaking models. Um, yeah, I had a lot of Gorka Morka gangs, as I remember, although I didn't like Diganob as much because those human Gorka Morka ones were weird. <laughs> uh and yes the most recent cool episode, weird the most recent episode was literally called girls gone wild and kipper bad it is <laughs> hysterical it is hysterical and kind of gross but mostly hysterical 
like i literally had to fast forward i think through about 10 seconds because it was like ah this is too much about vomit but uh <laughs> in any event uh, uh also please check out rookery publications it's fantastic <laughs> to watch and a lot of go- i'm not joking i literally had to skip part because i was like this is just this it's too descriptive it's gross i don't want to watch this anymore <laughs> i'm moving on but uh oh, good times uh, yeah rookery publications as well please check out uh they do a lot of fantastic stuff over there a lot of great interviews they've had all sorts of different people on uh, a lot of people that you all know and love from your favorite black library authors to people who help create warhammer uh to artists to uh game devs even uh they also yeah. get more game devs on there but um I've even been on there, but uh, you have. The, You're awesome. The most, uh, the most recent episode was with the Chaos Rising guys. It is very yeah. interesting, super fun. fucking interesting. Um, I actually learned a lot about the show that I did not realize, which is surprising because I was there literally chatting with them about it. Um, learning about the all the stuff behind the creature uh, was really, really interesting in particular. I like that part a lot. The creature, yeah, yeah. For, <laughs> creature, for, for, creature for, for, thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, um, the creature <laughs> yeah so thank you all very much for watching uh that's gonna be us for here today uh there is gonna be a very fast turnaround between this mm-hmm. episode of lord beards and the next one which is this sunday yes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, next sunday. So the vote is going to be on my channel um and it's gonna Your be channel. very short like y'all have until we'll probably give you until like friday saturday. evening saturday, friday, saturday. Yeah. yeah. Um. And it's it's gonna be the final Spooktober one. So we're gonna pick three pretty terrifying ideas, subjects, and uh, we'll see who wins. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Take care. Thank and you very much. You all rock. Bye bye. Bye bye.